Okay, and we are live on YouTube. Mark. Um, good morning. This is the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting of September 28th. I'll call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Bland. Commissioner Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner, Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner uh, Gustafson. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Okay, great. Welcome everyone and welcome to the September 28th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This public hearing and public meeting are being held via Zoom only and um, being live streamed and it's li being live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch the proceedings, you may do so on YouTube. If you would like to participate in the hearing items, you may join the meeting. The webinar information is on our screen right now. And it is also uh, on our website. If you go to the hearing section of our website and you can join the meeting. And when we take testimony, you can raise your virtual hand and we will call on you to speak. Um, so we are gonna start this morning with a public hearing on a proposed designation. And after that, we will move to our uh, public meeting and public hearing for applications for work on designated properties. So first I'm going to turn it over to our director of research, Kate Lemus McHale. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Today's first item, number one, is LP 2654, um, 200 Madison Avenue, first floor lobby interior at 200 Madison Avenue, AKA 200 to 214 Madison Avenue, 11 to 19 East 35th Street, uh, 10 to 20 East 36th Street in Manhattan, block 865, lot 14. And the item proposed for a public hearing is the proposed designation of the ornate T-shaped first floor lobby of 200 Madison Avenue designed in the neo-Renaissance style by Warren and Wetmore in 1925 to 26, consisting of a through block arcade and perpendicular elevator hall, East 35th and East 36th Street entrance foyers, and the fixtures and interior components of these spaces, which may include but are not limited to the historic wall surfaces, uh, ceiling surfaces, floor surfaces, lighting fixtures, attached furnishings, vestibule and elevator doors, decorative metalwork and attached decorative elements. Designed by Warren and Wetmore in 1925 to 26, 200 Madison Avenue contains one of the most ornate office building lobbies in Manhattan. The first floor interior features a through block arcade with intricately detailed vaulted ceilings, gilded reliefs, terrazzo floors, polished marble walls, ornamental metalwork and mosaics. Located in the Murray Hill section of Midtown Manhattan, 200 Madison Avenue extends a full block between East 35th and East 36th Streets. The proposed first floor lobby interior landmark shown on the right, um, indicated with the red outline as a T-shaped space that incorporates a through block arcade, perpendicular elevator hall, and two entrance foyers. 200 Madison Avenue was commissioned by Jesse H. Jones and the Houston Properties Company. Construction began in 1925 and was completed in 1926. Due to zoning requirements, it was built as a mixed use structure with separate lobbies and entrances for residential and commercial tenants. The historic first floor lobby has a vaulted arcade that connects East 35th and East 36th Streets. To negotiate a sloping site, the arcade incorporates steps, ramps, and landings. The lobby of 200 Madison Avenue is among Warren and Wetmore's finest and best preserved interiors. Active from 1900 to 1930, this prolific firm was consistently inventive interpreter of the classical tradition, including a, a 
significant group of New York City landmarks and interior landmarks, including the lobbies of Steinway Hall, the Madison Belmont Building, and the New York Central Building. The arcade and entrance foyers have highly polished marble walls, patterned terrazzo floors, and gilded plaster ceilings inspired by Renaissance, Baroque, and 18th century English sources. The ceilings and upper walls incorporate dense fields of low plaster relief set against dark green and Pompeian red grounds. At mid-block is the elevator hall, which extends from the arcade toward Madison Avenue. Like the arcade, it features a terrazzo floor, marble walls, and an elaborate vaulted ceiling. The plaster ceilings incorporate various kinds of naturalistic imagery, including rosettes, leaves, and vines. In the south part of the arcade, as well as in the elevator hall, are stylized images of peacocks, a common symbol of pride and prosperity. At the south end of the arcade is a large saucer dome that rests on pendentives decorated with fanciful images of griffins and dragons. In the arcade, each arched bay incorporates a band of floral mosaics, an animal medallion, and a pair of projecting lion heads. Near the elevator hall on the east wall are twin brass tenant directories. You can see those here. There are also gleaming brass elevator and service doors, as well as two ornate mailboxes. The concentration of well-preserved detail dazzles with the intensity of the approaching Art Deco size, style, which the lobby anticipates without adopting modern forms or materials. The proposed interior landmark incorporates the highly intact historic T-shaped lobby, which originally served the office building. As originally built, 200 Madison Avenue had two lobbies. The Madison Avenue lobby served the apartment hotel in the lower floors, and the East 35th and East 36th Street entrances and arcades served the office building. When the hotel closed in the late 1930s, the lobbies were joined, and the Madison Avenue entrance and lobby were subsequently modified. As discussed when this was calendared, alterations have changed both the finishes and footprint of the Madison Avenue lobby and the proposed landmark site follows the original boundary of the office building lobby. The first floor lobby of 200 Madison Avenue is among Warren and Wetmore's least known and most impressive interiors. Aside from respectful alterations to the reception area, lighting and other minor modifications, this magnificent public lobby is really wonderfully preserved and looks much as it did in the 1920s when 200 Madison Avenue first opened. Uh, thank you. And I'm here, and so is Matt Postal, who um, is working on this report for any questions. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you, Matt, for your work. So, commissioners, we're, we're going to move to public testimony, but if anyone has any questions now, we can certainly take those questions. Okay, I don't see any questions, so we'll go ahead and we'll move to the testimony. Um, I am going to turn it over to Lisa Krosavich, our director, uh, our executive director, excuse me, to walk us through the testimony. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, and the first person who has signed up is Frank Cambria. And while I bring him in, I would just remind everybody if you would um, like to speak on this item, please do raise your hand. Okay, Frank, I've brought you in as a panelist. You need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you like. Hello? Can you Hi, we can hear and see you. Yes. Okay. Good morning and thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I am Frank Cambria representing George Comfort and Sons and the owners of 200 Madison Avenue. And I want to offer our enthusiastic support for the proposed designation of the lobby as an interior landmark. The nearly 100 year old lobby has amazing detail to it from the elevator doors, the floors and walls, and of course the ceilings. This lobby is so beautiful and defines the craftsmanship that went into the design and construction of the buildings back then 
and should be preserved. George Comfort and Sons has carefully maintained the lobby and in its historic appearance and welcomes the designation of New York City Interior Landmark. It's, it's truly a great feature and let me tell you, many, many people come in and they look at it and they, the first thing they walk in, they say, this is absolutely a beautiful lobby and they love it and so do we. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And next we have Andrea Goldwyn. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is pleased to support designation of the lobby at 200 Madison Avenue as an interior landmark. This 1926 Warren and Wetmore building offers several delightful contrasts. The handsome red brick primary facade facing Madison Avenue is somewhat restrained. The tower and side facades hint at the interior with more elaborate decorative elements. However, it is the lobby that truly dazzles. The Neo-Renaissance Hall features a stunning array of ornament from the rosettes at the elegant vaulted ceiling to the gilded walls to the marble and terrazzo flooring. This is a special interior. Throughout the full block volume, gilded reliefs, floral mosaics, ornamental ironwork, and stylized lion heads, peacocks, dragons, and griffins welcome workers and visitors. This glorious space is a reminder of the distinct attraction that New York's office buildings can provide. If designated, this lobby will join a select group of New York's finest interiors. We appreciate the owner's stewardship of this property and are happy to offer them assistance from our preservation services staff. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Great, thank you, Andrea. And with that, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. All right, so I think that um, wraps up the testimony. Uh, commissioners, do we have any final questions for Kate or Matt before we close the hearing? Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and make a motion to close the hearing. I am uh, requesting to unmute you all so we can take that vote and um, we will have this back for a vote in the near future. So um, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, the hearing is closed and department agenda. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, now move to Preservation Department's uh, public meeting item. Uh, it'll maybe be just a minute while we make sure everyone is in place, but I'll go ahead and get that started by reading it into the record. Uh, this is item number one, LPC 22-01019, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1280, lot one, 89 East 42nd Street, AKA 71 to 105 East 42nd Street, Grand Central Terminal, individual and interior landmark. This is a French Beaux-Arts style railroad terminal designed by Reed and Stem and Warren and Wetmore and built in 1903 to 1913. The application is to replace sidewalk paving and install bollards at the viaduct. This was last presented at the public hearing of September 14th, 2021, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, and please note that at the public hearing, most commissioners expressed a preference for natural stone paving and real bronze for the inlay. And some had questions about missing historic lampposts after the issue was raised in public testimony. The applicants have returned to present more information and a revised proposal after we open the proceedings. But first, Mark Silverman, LPC General Counsel, will make some remarks. Thank you, Corey. Um, commissioners, I'm just, uh, I want to comment briefly on the issue of the missing lamppost that was raised at the last hearing by the Victorian Society of America, for which we thank them. And I've had uh, subsequent conversations with them uh, as well as um, a former staff person who was involved. Um, the lampposts uh, were removed pursuant to an advisory report issued to the, to the Department of Transportation in the mid 1980s. Um, the, um, uh, we are in the process of talking to DOT about 
um, uh, future reinstallation uh, and trying to figure out exactly um, uh, uh, how many restored lampposts exist um, and, and are in storage. They're in storage in Utah, actually. Um, the uh, historic photos show that uh, the entire balustrade uh, on 42nd Street, as well as going down Vanderbilt as, and part of the way down on the east side near the site uh, in question today, that there were um, a few lampposts. There were lampposts. Now, just a few of them were in the area under the easement uh, that is in, within the work proposed for you today. Um, the, uh, so we are working with DOT to um, talk about a future reinstallation of all of the lampposts. With respect to the work before you today, um, the work is, as proposed, is limited to replacing the sidewalk in bollards. No work on the balustrade or the historic railing um, is proposed. Um, and um, based on our um, uh, discussions with DOT, we will be uh, looking forward to finding a time to um, bring those back and reinstall them in the future. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so thank you, Mark. I think what we'll do is we'll open the proceedings and uh, have the applicants present their revised proposal, and then we can take questions either for the applicants or for you. Uh, okay. So, Commissioner um, Chapin, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Motion to open the proceedings. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the applicants may present. Thank you. Good, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. My name is Adam Green. I'm with RxR, and we are partners with TF Cornerstone in the redevelopment of 175 Park Avenue. Today, I'm joined in this presentation by Rami Abul Khalil from SOM to provide updates regarding the proposed sidewalk improvements at Grand Central Terminal. Also, here from our team to answer questions is Amir Stein from TF Cornerstone. David Karnofsky from Freed Frank and Frank Pryle from Buyer Blender Bell. If we could flip to the next slide, please. Thank you for the introduction. Um, but as a brief reminder, we're here seeking a certificate of appropriateness for improvements to the sidewalk area adjacent to Grand Central Terminal's elevated roadway shown here. In this photograph, we're looking north with the Grand Hyatt on the right and Grand Central on the left. The existing conditions within the project area today are unattractive and worn and not harmonious with Grand Central Terminal. Rami, could you please take us through the proposed improvements? Thank you, Adam. Hello, everyone. The proposed improvements will continue the long-standing use of this sidewalk for pedestrians, but restore it to have an appearance that we think is going to be compatible with the palette and materiality of the terminal itself. And in response to comments received at the public hearing, we will not be using precast concrete pavers for the sidewalk treatment, so the sidewalk will have a granite curb and granite paving. We also wanted to clarify that the safety bollards that you see here um, will be made out of bronze, and that's going to be compatible with the existing bollards currently in front of uh, the terminal on 42nd Street. In response to feedback uh, received at the hearing, we also would like to highlight a few design elements that we think will help delineate uh, the boundary between the landmarked property uh, and lot 30. So in addition to the bronze movement joints that will be located at the property line that you see here, the proposed sidewalk improvement area is gonna remain free of obstructions, as you can see in this image, other than the safety bothers, of course. but uh, and that's going to be in contrast with the adjoining public space on lot 30. And that will be heavily programmed with seating, planting, skylights, other amenities. And so the sidewalk will have a different character automatically than the adjoining public terrace because of this differentiation in programming. Uh, further, the proposed work, uh, as Mark mentioned, will not be altering or affecting the visual presence of the existing historic balustrade along 42nd Street that you see here in these images. And we think that that will also uh, contribute to serve and continue to serve as a visual indicator of that boundary between lot one and lot 30. <clears throat> Sorry, it was on mute. Uh, I'd like to address a little further the testimony um, made at the previous hearing by the Victorian Society that Grand Central's historic lamppost should be reintroduced as part of the sidewalk improvements. It is our understanding that the lampposts were once located all around Grand Central 
at the points indicated on this diagram. Now, our proposed sidewalk improvements are not located at the balustrade or railing where the lamp posts were once located. And the proposed improvements that we're discussing would neither affect these areas nor preclude any future reinstallation of the lamp posts. So we have no objection to the, re the reinstallation of these lamp posts should DOT or any other agency determine in the future that they would like to do so. Thanks, Adam. Finally, we want to make it clear that contrary to testimony received uh, at the public hearing, the proposed 155 square foot sidewalk extension that you see here highlighted in, in yellow uh, would not in any way encroach upon the elevated roadway itself. And so it wouldn't create dangerous conditions for pedestrians and um, and drivers. So the small sidewalk extension would be located in an area that's currently used as parking by the owners of the adjoining property. And as you can see in this rendering, uh, you know, we don't think it would encroach, uh, we don't think it would create hazardous conditions because it's not encroaching into uh, the vehicular travel lane. So in conclusion, our proposal um, would continue the longstanding use of this area as a sidewalk, would not encroach on the elevated roadway, would not affect historic elements on the Grand Central Terminal lot, uh, would enhance opportunities to finally appreciate the eastern facade of the Grand Central Terminal from that, uh, that, that um, elevated level, and would be compatible with the palette of the terminal and not preclude the reinstallation of the lampposts um, around Grand Central Terminal in the future. Um, thank you for your consideration for, uh, of our proposal. Um, we think this will really restore the sidewalk in a way uh, befitting uh, Grand Central Terminal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, are, do we have any questions? Either for the applicants or for Mark or the staff? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I think we'll move to our discussion. So I am um, requesting to unmute all of you so that you can participate. And um, I just also, before we start our discussion, want to note for the record that Commissioner Bland, Vice Chair Bland, is recused on this item and has not been present this morning for this um, item. So we're going to start our discussion as has been presented. Um, this is an application to replace sidewalk paving on a portion of the viaduct that's on the landmark site that is modern paving with new granite paving um, and to replace existing bollards with new bollards and to extend the sidewalk um, slightly at the northern end. And in response to our comments last time, we, we asked for natural stone and real bronze materials. The applicants have uh, presented today those revisions that respond to those requests um, and the uh, missing lampposts are not part of the scope of this work. Um, and as we've heard, were removed pursuant to a, an advisory report issued to DOT with the intention of their reinstallation. So we'll be working with the DOT um, and pursuing that reinstallation. Um, but in the meantime, we have this application before us that um, is for this limited scope of work. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner mm -hmm. Holford-Smith, would you like to start this one? Yes. Uh, I think that the applicant has been responsive to the comments that were made uh, prior. And I think that was, uh, the work is compatible with Grand Central Terminal. And I think it's, I think it's appropriate to show. Great, thank you. And I just also want to note for the record, which is you all know, we did receive extensive um, written comments from uh, the Victorian Society of New York and Hiller PC on behalf of Cristobal Goff. And so those, as you know, have all been distributed to you, but I just want to state that for the record. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I think uh, the applicant has been very responsive. Uh, I think that the whole project, including the uh, that we saw earlier, is going to be a great improvement. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear uh, from the both the, the from the, our council and from the applicant about the plans for the land post, which I think will be a really nice addition in the future. Mm -hmm. So. I can approve this as presented. I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Uh, thanks, sir. Yeah, I, I had issues with the bollards and the pavement, and they've uh, 
uh, they've solved those issues for me. I can approve it. Thank you. Commissioner Chen? I agree wholeheartedly with all the comments. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi? The changes are very appropriate. Thank you to the applicant. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson? Appropriate. And Commissioner Shamir Barron? Appropriate and approved. Okay. All right. So I think we have a, a consensus here. Uh, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion? Yes. A motion? Yeah. The matter of LPC 2201019, 89 East 42nd Street, AKA 71105 East 42nd Street, Grand Central Terminal, individual and interior level. French Beaux Arts style railroad terminal designed by Reading Stem and Longley Wetmore and built in 1903 and 1913. The application is to replace sidewalk paving and install bollards with the viaduct. I recommend approval. Finding that the existing paving and bollards at this section of the viaduct level of the terminal were installed in connection with the construction of the original Commodore Hotel pursuant to a, to a historic use easement. That the proposed work to replace the existing non historic paving and slightly expand its footprint will expand public access to viewing the terminal at the viaduct level without eliminating or damaging any significant architectural features. That the proposed work will not affect the historic 42nd Street Balustrade or the historic handrail separating the up and down roadways on the east viaduct. That the installation of the bronze inlay at the lot line will maintain visual cues to the original footprint of the viaduct level at the terminal. That the proposed natural stone paving and curbing will feature materials, textures, and tones that will be harmonious with the building's material and finished palette and commensurate with its grandeur. That the proposed metal bollards will be simply designed and typical in terms of placement, size, material, details, and finish, and that the work will support the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. So that's approved, thank you. And we'll now move to our public hearing agenda. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And the first public hearing item is number one. LPC 21, uh, LPC 22-01205, application for a binding report in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1117, lot one, 95 Prospect Park West, uh, Prospect Park, Litchfield Villa, individual landmark. This is an Italianate style mansion designed by Alexander J. Davis, built circa 1850, within a primarily naturalistic style park designed in 1865 by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox. The application is to construct a ramp, replace a door, and install flagpoles. Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the meeting. Um, Svetlana, you now have control of the slides. Please just click on the screen and you can advance using your arrow keys. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Svetlana Ragulina, a landscape architect with the Prospect Park Alliance. And I'm also joined by Christian Zimmerman, Vice President of the Alliance, and Mike Lee with New York City Parks. Today, I present to you a project for the construction of a permanent main entrance ramp at the Litchfield Villa. The goal of this project is to improve accessibility, giving everyone the same experience when entering the villa. This landmark building is located at the intersection of Prospect Park West and Fifth Street in Brooklyn, and it serves as office and meeting space for the Brooklyn Parks Administration and also the Prospect Park Alliance. The villa was designed by Alexander Jackson Davis. It was constructed in the, in the 1850s and occupied by the Litchfield family until about 1892. At that point, the villa became park's headquarters. This is an aerial from 1934, and it shows the original stucco facade before it was removed and exposed the brick underneath. 
Note the unvegetated terraces retained by um, landscape walls that wrap around the base of the building. These brownstone landscape walls still exist today in most portions, but the terrace, which is the lighter color that you see, has mostly been planted and is no longer accessible the way it used to be. It's in one of these terrace spaces at the northwest corner of the building that we are proposing to incorporate a ramp. Please also note the flagpole that was later added to the top of the building, the pole right there. It was, um, it was added by the Parks Department and our design will include two smaller flagpoles at the entrance. Here are some additional historic photos. In the bottom two, you can see the intro introduction of planting between the brownstone walls and the building. And here actually in this photo, you see the flagpole was moved to the building facade. Here are some historic floor plans for the building. Um, the survey on the right is from 1935. It's showing the annex expansion and the paths that were added to the rear of the building as the parks department took over the site. As the villa transitioned to parks headquarters, the grounds have also undergone numerous additions and modifications. And I can return to site history if anyone has any specific questions. So now for some site photos. Here we have the site plan on the top and um, this is the front of the building at the main entrance. Picture number one and two um, show the proposed ramp location and in the, in the northwest corner of the building. The brownstone wall was removed here a few years ago and is in storage. Um, the plan is to weave the ramp switch back in between the facade of the building and the restored historic wall. At the main entrance steps, which is the photo on the right, you see a temporary wooden staircase that has been placed on top of the historic steps for safety reasons. In the photo, you can see that the top two steps at the doorway are granite, then that continues to a brownstone landing. And behind the cheek wall that's puckered there and the pier, there are five additional brownstone steps. So in these photos, you see on the left, you see the front view of the main staircase and clearly you see the five brownstone steps, then a landing and then two granite steps at the doorway. On the right, you see a close up of the top two granite steps the step at the top of the door is actually wrapping itself around the base of the building. And towards you, the left, you see a concrete terrace. Our ramp will come right up against that terrace, but we are not modifying it in any sort of way. So again, a closer look at the steps. And then looking north, from the steps from the landing um, is the soiled filled area where the ramp will be installed. So there on the left is a piece of plywood that's retaining the soil, but we will reinstall the original brownstone wall there. So for comparison, here's the existing plan and the proposed plan on the right. We'll close up with more detail. The original brownstone wall um, was eight pieces, but we're only reinstalling six of them. The surface of the ramp would be granite as it wraps around, meets the granite landing, and then the top granite step flush. Uh, we would also have to add a brushed uh, stainless steel handrail at the upper portion of the ramp, wherever there's a slope that's over 5%, which we have here at the top. Um, where you see the double line at the handrail, there will be an additional guardrail that needs to be added uh, wherever there's a drop that's greater than 30 inches by code. And in the plan, you also see the two flagpoles that we're adding. They're, they will be 15 feet height and they will um, frame the entrance to the building. This is a section looking north at the staircase. You can see we have the original five brownstone steps and we are adding two cast stone brown, 
uh, brownstone color to match steps on top of those with the granite landing. And here you see the handrail that's 36 inches height and then six, inch, six inches taller is the guardrail with pickets. We have the existing and the proposed building elevation. Um, in the, the elevation on the bottom, you see the cast stone brownstone is beyond um, the original brownstone wall. And the, the same goes for this, the five original steps with the two cast stone steps on top. We have the simple handrail wrapping itself around the top of the ramp going down the steps and the guardrail uh, wherever there's a height of greater than 30 inches. So this is a view from the Southern approach. As you can see, the handrail is fairly is simple and minimal. Um, and then the, 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 we have the taller guardrail with the pickets. Also aluminum 15 foot height flagpoles, which are brushed aluminum. And this is a view from the north. Here, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to see, to see that drop. It's almost four feet tall. So we need the guardrail um, there. And here are the materials. Um, we will be using stainless steel for the handrail. It requires less maintenance than using other materials. This is the color. Um, then for the flagpole, it'll be a brushed aluminum flagpole. For the granite, we've chosen a Bethel white granite that'll match the building granite that's already there and also the step. And the brownstone that we've chosen, the cast stone, will match the existing brownstone as well. And that concludes our presentation. We hope that with the addition of this main ramp, all people from the public and the administration can have the same experience when entering this historic building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Shamir Barron, followed by Commissioner Chapin. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about the stainless steel material. Um, in the, these kind of renderings, like the one we're looking at now, it actually looks more like a, like a, a painted or maybe even a bronze. And I'm wondering if, and I understand that it's, it's, um, it's easier to tend to the stainless steel, but wondering if you've considered and if you might consider something that's um, sort of a little bit more historic. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually considered it pretty extensively. Um, in the rear of the building, I actually have a slide for this question. Oh. Oops. In the rear of the building, there is um, there is a painted black steel guardrail, and there's also a handrail that's black pipe. Yeah. Um, but in the front of the building, um, there are we recently re in the early 2000s we reinstalled um, the fl flashing around the building that you could see here, and it's actually all lead coated copper, and so we feel that this kind of material would, would look better with a stainless steel material. We also have, have noted that it's really, it's been really challenging to maintain the painted steel guardrails. As you can see, like in this close up, it chips off pretty frequently and it's not necessarily maintained to, to the standard that it should be. Um, so I think we're going for something that's less maintenance and also just matches the front facade of the of the building. Oops. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a similar question. Um, be, I could see using an easily maintainable material uh, on the um, the ramp, but I, f I feel that the appearance of this the um, guardrails on the stairs seems out of character for me for the age of the building. Obviously, you don't have a 
because it's a different building, you don't have the sort of thing you have at the arsenal, uh, where you do have a historic, uh, you have historic railing, uh, but uh, to look to look at, but it just seems like something more like a picket or something would be appropriate and could surely be maintained just on the stairway uh, as opposed to the entire ramp is what I'm thinking. So anyway, uh, that was my my uh, concern question, I guess. Um, uh, you know, if perhaps at least the the uh, guardrails for the stairs could be something that seems a little more appropriate to the age of the building. So would you like to respond to that, the, the question about considering two different materials for the metal work? Um, we can, we can look, definitely look at that again. Okay. All right, other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have more questions after that. So um, I am going to turn it over to Lisa. Are you going to take yep. this one? Okay, Lisa Krasavage, our executive director who will take us through the testimony. And we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to anyone else. But whether you signed up in advance or not, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you in the, in the uh, attendee section. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, great. Uh, we'll start with um, Diego Rubio. Diego, you just need to, there you go. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Rovallo and I'm going to speak on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC is concerned that the color match between the proposed precast concrete product and the existing brown, brownstone stoop will be difficult to match. We wonder whether a concrete substrate with brownstone stucco would not be an easier color match. We also find a transition from simple guardrail to guardrail with vertical spindles is awkward and that the simpler guardrail with an intermediate horizontal rail would be more appropriate and less noticeable. Finally, we find the proposed railing material of stain, stainless steel to be inappropriate. It should be black painted steel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next I'll call George Calderaro. George. Good morning, Commissioners. George Calderaro, Chair of the Preservation Committee of the Victorian Society, New York. Litchfield Village, originally called Grace Hill, is one of the finest freestanding houses in the city and is of national importance. We find this proposal falls short. The brownstone garden wall missing from the site but supposedly available for reinstallation fortuitously enclosed encloses a space proposed for the switchback ramp, but this ramp doesn't meet minimum dimensional standards, lacks required details, and may not work as designed. The applicant failed to provide an image of the existing accessible route. We have done so in our illustrated testimony, which we submitted last week. The current route takes advantage of the natural slope up the side porch. Upgrades to this route route to meet current codes could be made easily and unobtrusively. Accessibility regulations provide for exceptions for historic properties, allowing alternative access routes. The Victorian Society isn't persuaded that this ramp to the main entrance should be approved on a house of this architectural significance without fully exploring other options. But if it is approved, some changes are needed. The railing should be painted black to minimize their visibility. The awkward change of railing design in the middle of the run should be eliminated. The ramp surface should be a dark, less obtrusive material such as asphalt hex pavers rather than white granite. The twin flagpoles are superfluous, distracting, and in 
appropriate. If a flagpole is wanted, there is a historic precedent for one at the top of the tower. In-kind replacement of the mid 20th century front door and transom is not appropriate. We do not agree with the applicant's reference to this door as historic, not on an 1855 house of this style and importance. The actual historic doors and transom are documented and should be replicated. We note that the second of two goals of this project to, quote, improve accessible parking spaces near Litchfield Village is not accompanied by any proposal. What, what is this work? The rest of our testimony is devoted to the Parks Department's appalling level of stewardship of this landmark. Our written testimony illustrates rotting wood throughout, disintegrating historic windows, peeling paint everywhere, pavements and stair in disrepair. Incredibly, a missing section of leader has been allowed, has been allowing rainwater to pour onto the wood porch, destroying one of its unique columns. This is happening but a few feet away from the reserved parking spaces for the borough chief of operations, prospect park administrator, and other managers. The condition of Grace Hill is disgraceful. We call on the Landmarks Commission to work with the Parks Department to ensure the attention and funding required to properly care for this landmark. And this should include the opening of the spectacular, rarely spectacular and largely intact historic interior to the public, which has been essentially barred for years. Instead of the public amenity that uh, it should be, Litchfield Village is being used as a private office building for a parks department that is allowing it to dis disintegrate around them. It's long past time to change this dynamic and fulfill the intent of the commission in 1966 when it designated the landmark and admonished Brooklyn to cherish this unique building. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, and next uh, hand, Christabel Goff. I see that you're not muted and your camera's on. Should be able to speak. Um, Christabel, if you are talking, we can't hear you, but you're not muted. Wonder if the volume needs to be turned up on her computer. It, it, yeah, I think it's something on your device, first of all. Um, you could also try to call in. We have the number on the screen. which I, I can't actually see you <laughs> to know if you're hearing me. Um, first of all, I, I guess my suggestion is because we can't hear you to try and quick call in if you can. And the 646-558-8656 number. Um, okay, there, I think we, I'll just remove, Christabel, I'm going to remove you because we can't hear you. Christabel, you. Try, try to call in on the phone number because we do want to hear from you. All right, maybe while she's figuring that out, we'll move to the next person. Um, those are the three people that had signed up. 
is there anybody else that would like to speak? That is. Okay. And Crystal, you could also email me or Anthony, or Sasha for some help. Okay. I mean, and if it helps, I know that um, in when Christabel signed up to speak, she did indicate that she was opposed. Um, so I, uh, I think we've heard some other comments today about materials and um, we'll ask the applicants to respond to that. But before I do, I wanna just note that uh, Brooklyn uh, Borough Board approved the application. That's, that's all of the Brooklyn Community Boards. And Brooklyn Community Board 7 is not submitting a resolution at this time. Um, it doesn't usually take items on Prospect Park, uh, but the Borough Board did approve it. And, um, and then the other letters that we have um, have already been represented by speakers. So we'll um, turn back to the applicants and I'll ask you to address some of the comments that we've heard about the cast stone material um, and whether I think the suggestion was a stucco might be a closer match to brownstone, um, the design of the railing and the finish of the railings. And I think there were also comments on the paving as well and the flagpoles. So if you'd like to go ahead and respond to any of those comments, please do so now. Um, Christian, would you like to take any of the comments? Um, well, I wanted to- You've got the railing or- Yeah, I wanted to start with, um, good morning, commissioners. I wanted to start with the broader, before we narrow into that, we, um, the, the comments. Um, Borough Commissioner Marty Marr, who's the Parks Department's Borough Commissioner, has been focused on the building. As you know, it's, it's an old building. It's very expensive um, to restore, but he's been um, working very diligently in fundraising with the public officials to try and restore not only the, the villa, but all of Grace Hill, the entire landscape and um, the acres around it. So this is, we are going to come to you in the future with a phased, essentially a master plan that we're working on and trying to figure out how to uh, restore this area and getting uh, numbers for it. Uh, he, he was able to fundraise enough to do this initial phase, um, which was providing access for everyone. We did look into the side route. We actually started that way as um, the one person said. The, the issue with that is one, it's not equal, and two, it goes into a lobby that goes into a conference room. Um, so it's really not accessing the building in a public way, like the front entrance. You'd be either you go right and you go into an office or you go left and you go into a conference room. So um, we would have to change the interior dynamic, if you will, um, to make that work. So just from function, it, the side does not work for us. So those are those points. And I'll let you start, Setlani, with the other things. So I think there was a comment about um, swapping out asphalt hex block for the granite pavement. Um, we do feel that we were actually trying to match the materiality of the building more. And historically that portion between the walls was a light crushed stone material as seen in the 1934 photo and other photos. So we thought that the granite would work best in, in that situation as the pavement type, sort of distinguishing what's the road, what's the driveway, and then the ramp or you know what's incorporated as part of the building. Um, in terms of the stucco, the cast stone, as you know, will be constructed offsite by a credible manufacturer. Um, and we have received samples of it. And after we clean the original brownstone that's on site, it, it is a really good match. Um, that's just how we, you know, that's what we see as of now. We, I, I, we would look, we could look into the stucco option, but um, a lot of this comes down to having to work with 
the bidding um, situation, having to have uh, contractors that can install this at the highest level. So we do think that a cast material would give us the best result. Um, I'm sorry, well, where were the other questions? Um, oh, there were comments on the design, the simple, simplifying the design and the black finish. So the guardrails, unfortunately, um, with the, whether they're horizontal or vertical pickets, um, we are not, we cannot remove by code because of the drop. Um, that is, we really, <laughs> we've tried, but we really can't do anything about that. I think there was a recommendation to have the, the barrier of the guardrail be vertical instead of, or sorry, horizontal instead of vertical. And um, we were we were also kind of thinking historically, you know, pickets were vertical, not horizontal. Horizontal tends to look more modern. So that's why they are vertical. They're spaced four inches apart. Um, and again, the material, uh, we realize that it's a black painted material a steel everywhere all around Park Slope and historic districts, but we've seen how it looks in, in areas around the park and how it's maintained. And we really think that moving forward, um, we should install a material that uh, will just last longer and will not need coats of paint reapplied haphazardly over and over again. Um, so that is why we're proposing stainless steel. Okay. All right, I, one question though, on the stainless steel and the renderings, it looks very sort of matte and, and um, dull and, and not shiny. And so can you just speak to the stint of the finish? Cause I know you were talking about it relating to the lead coated copper on the flashing, right? The lead coated copper on the flashing has, a, has slightly more of like a bluish tint to it, I would say. Um, the brushed stainless steel and also the aluminum flagpoles will not be reflected. They'll be brushed. So it'll have a duller finish, but not as dull as if it was painted gray. Um, it'll just be slightly reflective. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I do see that Christabel has raised her hand and I know we've concluded the testimony, but she had technical difficulties. So I just want to take a moment to see if we can actually get her in. So Lisa, do you want to just see if we can move? Yes. In I'm going to allow the person that called in to speak because I think this might be Christabel. So let's um, see if this works. Okay. Uh, to the person on the phone, which I think might be Christabel, um, I've allowed you to speak. Is that you, Christabel? It's muted, so you just have to unmute. How do you unmute on the phone? Unmute a star six. Star six, press star six. I'm going to send a request to unmute. Maybe at the same time, I'll bring in Christabel with her hand raised. Oh, it went, it almost worked for a minute there. It unmuted and then muted back again. Good. There, we think we got it. Oh, well, I'm so sorry about these difficulties. No worries. No We're worries. glad you made it in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the, so, uh, uh, 95 Prospect Park West, Richfield Villa. This is Chris Bill Goff for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Things fall apart. In 1919, although the Treaty of Versailles was being written, the poet, Yeats, took a dark view of our civilization. He wrote, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. We were reminded of those lines, seeing the Victorian society's photo documentation of the present condition of Richfield Villa. 
This fine, the fine 19th century woodwork of the city-owned individual landmark is rotting and falling to pieces while the administration condoning this instead budgets more than a million dollars to deface the facade with a monumentally sized utilitarian access ramp for wheelchairs. As you know, when a landmark building is made accessible, the requirement to place the ramp at the front door can be waived. If ever there was a case for demanding that waiver, it is here. Given the building size and location, the ramp could be redesigned and relocated without causing any significant harm to potential users. But the potential harm to A.J. Davis's masterful design, executed in 1857 and landmarked since 1966, could be catastrophic. The designation report notes, this romantic mansion commanding a small hill in Prospect Park is one of the finest Italian villa style houses in the country. For Thomas Jefferson in 1809 in Washington, Benjamin Latrobe first proposed the patriotic gesture of creating column capitals topped with corn cobs instead of the canvas leaves for Monticello and the Capitol. 50 years later, A.J. Davis recreated this interesting American decorative gesture at Litchfield Villa. Such are the architectural details now allowed to rot. We hope that the city will reconsider, relocate the ramp and undertake urgently necessary repainting and repairs to the exterior woodwork before it is too late. Otherwise, it will be hard to believe that landmark designation still affords protection or that the administration and this commission retain any respect for the original intent of the landmarks law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I know we have um, some questions from the commissioners, but I do want to just go back and ask if the applicants did want to address again this larger issue about um, the stewardship of the building and kind of the, I mean, I think that the goal to provide access is an important one for all of our landmarks. Um, and I, we you know, always find a way to find an appropriate solution, but, um, you know, having sort of personal connections to people who actually can't gain access to important places of history that are meaningful. I, th I think it's um, it's a very important goal that we need to try to achieve. But I think you did talk about other options and why there weren't other options. So I don't know if you want to sort of address that globally before we move on with commissioners' questions. Well, I. So the, when we presented, so the, the Prospect Park Alliance is advocating for getting more money for this building as well. And the Parks Department is. Um, it is sadly, you know, it just the reality, it's an office building now. Um, the, the main floor is um, the commissioner level, but it's also a, uh, it, it has a conference room that is a meeting place. And um, so, we're trying to create as much access for those who just don't have access. And it's part of, you know, um, and once I said again, I'm um, referring to the side, uh, we looked at that, the parks department felt in our presentation that what we were doing is we were giving access, second class access. We were not providing equal. So when we first presented it, to the parks department, they came to us and said, that is not equal. You are giving people a side entrance. Those who have disabilities enter from the side. Those who are able-bodied have front entrance, front access. So they were pretty strong in saying that is not equal. And yes, it's a historic building, but they, they sent us back to say, look at the front, trying to figure out a way. So we looked at the front and we, We've studied this a lot, and I guess we could bring that to you to show you um, in earnest that how we studied the site entrance. We thought it had merit, but the one thing it didn't have is equal access. 
um, and we couldn't answer that any other way. Um, but um, but we are actively trying to get money for it. Yes, the building has not um, been taken care of, um, but and the commissioner is actively fundraising for it. We figure we're in the ten plus million dollars to take care of it. This was he didn't want to. He wanted to get momentum going and saying, look, I'm doing something. So uh, he didn't want to just sit on the money and bank it. Or uh, he said, well, what do you have? Let's, let's do what we can. And then we'll call this phase one and then come back to us with a, a master plan and show how we'll address the parking lot, address the side, address the back, address the building. You know, whether we put stucco on, we need the windows replaced badly. They're in horrible shape. So um, we, we are aware of all of those issues. Um, and we're concerned, but it, it takes money, so. Um, this is Sybil Young from Parks. Uh, uh, just to add to what Christian's saying and um, from the Parks perspective, just how important that, that equal access is to us. We understand there are waivers for historic buildings, but we really feel the Alliance was able to, to do a job where they tucked that ramp in in a sensitive manner. And and really gave us that equal access that is so important to us. Okay. Oh, and also just to let you know, I think there was a comment about, it was fortuitous that the wall is gone. So we, the wall was falling over and we were afraid it was gonna fall on somebody. So we, um, prior to this, actually, we were working on a project to reinstall the wall, put a new foundation and actually stabilize it and put it back but then we got this money. So we weren't hiding the wall. We weren't pulling away just to make it look like, oh, now we can put a ramp here. It really, it was a safety issue and it's in storage and we can send you photographs that it's in storage, safe. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on with questions. We'll go to Commissioner Jefferson followed by Commissioner Shamir Barron. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Uh, one question about the front door, um, is it being replicated or is it being, uh, is it being replicated exactly 1850 or whenever it was? To answer that question, the door from the 1850s was actually a really wide double door. And then it was replaced in the late 1800s. It's a little unclear exactly the date because we don't have all that much photography on it, but it was replaced with a, a single door, which is what you see now. It was first painted a light color, and then eventually it was repainted to a dark brown color, which is what's there now. Because by code, the door needs to swing out, We have, and now it swings in. We will need to swap that out, um, and there's no way to do that without actually refabricating the door in kind. So we are refabricating the second door, which is the single door, not the double swing door. And But we will be changing the color back to the color from the late 1800s, which is the light creamy color. And, and the details would be similar to the existing door. It would be exact, yeah, would be exactly and, the same, but the hardware would, would change to meet code. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thanks. Uh, I'm wondering about the, um, the, the historic condition. I, I'm trying to look at the 1854 um, rendering and wondering if you know if there was ever a time that the terrace uh, wrapped the entire building or if it's always been the case that that kind of, I don't know what direction it is, but the top right corner um, was kind of landscaped right up against the building or what went on there. And the reason I'm asking about this is has to do with not so much an alternative entrance that's on the side, but an alternative entrance that's on the quote unquote back, but is kind of exactly equivalent to the front um, so, that, so that there would be this kind of symmetry of potential ramp in the, in the I don't wanna say, I don't, not pejoratively back, but the back and the stair in the front. Just curious if that was ever a continuous condition, the terrace. So the terrace wrapped itself around as it does now. Um, it's If you're facing the building, it's just around the front and then it goes halfway up to the side of the building. It doesn't continue all the way around. 
Um, it was used as a terrace. We actually have a historic photo of Mrs. who we think is Mrs. Litchfield sitting on that terrace. Um, and then as we mentioned before, we did look at the, at ramping the Southern side of the terrace of the, of the area in between the brownstone wall and the building. But the entrance to that goes into a very small vestibule that's like six feet by four feet, which then leads to a conference room. And for someone that needs to enter in that direction, if they are waiting for a meeting to start, it's just really not an, we would have to redesign the interior portion as well to make that side ramp work. Um, right. So is, so is the top right, so is that, what, what direction is that? Where there is no terrace, where there is no veranda in the old, in the historic rendering? It was on the Eastern side. What, what goes on there? Could there be something there in that? Corner? The veranda is actually elevated um, and there's the cellar is exposed on this Eastern side of the building. So there are steps, there's like 10 steps and there's another four steps that go up to the veranda. So are you saying that the ground drops in that corner? I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah, asking on the Eastern other... side. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it drops down pretty significantly. Um, if you could look the plan all the way to the right from the 1935 survey shows all those steps. The veranda is the wood porch. They, they changed the material. Um, yeah, so you there could not be a, a sort of a, a platform at the terrace elevation on that corner. At the I, height of the terrace, the, the I, I, think, I think that would just looking at this, um, I think that would mean quite an extensive ramp system um, that would weave itself through this landscape in, in the on the eastern side of the building. Christian, did you have a thought for that? Well, I was just thinking if it it's it's a floor lower that that where the the steps where you see where it says rustic rail fence kind of going that that is about one floor below the wooden porch. I think to do go into the back way, you would actually go to the bottom of that drawing and then take a left and we'd have to eliminate those steps and try and access it through that way. So you actually, I don't know how a ramp, you wouldn't actually probably, you'd have to do a ramp and then another ramp. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't be a switchback. It would be a ramp to eliminate the, those two steps and then those three steps. And then you'd go back down and then you'd have to create another ramp. So it's possible. It's a, I, I mean, we haven't done the math, you know, to find the grading and how to do something like that, but you would probably need two ramps to make that, but they would be, they wouldn't be switchbacks um, like we have to do in the front, yeah. um, but it's a long run to get to that back door. We are also limited by distance uh, for someone that comes and parks here from the ADA uh, spots. I think we're limited by something like a hundred feet or 200 feet or something. So the main entrance is, is within that range. All right, thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, not seeing questions. I'm going to start to unmute everybody or request to unmute you so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. So um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, Any opposed? Aye. OK, so the hearing is closed, and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and we've had um, a lot of discussion about the location of the ramp um, at the primary entrance, the materiality of the ramp, walls, and railings, um, and then so in our comments, we can address those. And then in addition, there are the two proposed flagpoles. So um, we'll go ahead and begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you start this one? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, 
Well, uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, distressing, uh, you know, commentary about the condition of the building. And uh, I hope that parks will be able to uh, get some significant government funding to help them uh, with this situation. Uh, in any event, uh, that, uh, to move on to the specific what we're reviewing today. Uh, I, I think that the location of the ramp is a unfortunate necessity in the sense that, uh, you know, we do try to provide uh, accessibility which is equal and to, uh, most of the time we say, yeah, it's not appropriate to move uh, to move someone around to another location for access uh, on the building. So we see a lot of this front access and until more solutions are found for this problem, uh, I, I think this is not inappropriate. Uh, I think that the door is, if it's done uh, is with the uh, detail that should be done to replicate as closely as possible the original, and is is appropriate. I think that the flags are really very, very typical for uh, headquarter facilities throughout the boroughs. And so I don't find those inappropriate and they're re removable, obviously. Uh, I've, I've, I'm most troubled, continue to be troubled by the fence, which I think uh, really, is, you know, just not coming across as appropriate for a historic building. The one that comes the closest is the section, which is the picket uh, section, uh, which actually they've got on the ramp, whereas I would expect to see that airs. And uh, I, I, um, I think that uh, both the color and what's the way the stair ramp is dealt with just doesn't seem to me uh, appropriate to a historic building of this uh, age. So I would recommend that they would, uh, you know, I know this is a binding report, you know, so uh, they look to try to make the fence uh, in both color and uh, in the case of the staircase, uh, more appropriate to the uh, the uh, historic building. So those are my comments for the moment. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Uh, hi, Sarah. I, I seem to have a, uh, my, my internet connection seems to be a little bit fuzzy. So if I break up, I, I apologize. Okay. Um, um, you know, I, I, I look at this building weekly, sometimes more than weekly. And um, even to, to begin with, I, I empathize greatly with the people who have to deal with this building because it is such a, a pile. It's a sinkhole of, of money. I mean, that's, that's what these things are. And, you know, I, I cringe every time I look at it because they took the stucco off. It's not AJ Davis to me anymore. It's it's a, it's a stucco building that has been stripped. Um, in any case, um, assuming as I I must that all of the possibilities for another handicapped entrance have been exhausted, which which I would I wish that wasn't the case and and. You know, I, I don't, I don't find this to be a wonderful solution. But if it's the only solution that they can provide for us, then that is what it is. And and all right, here we go. And and um, with regard to the comments about using stucco versus cast stone, with cast stone, you can you can make as many samples as you need to match that original brownstone. And the original brownstone, um, Portland, Connecticut brownstone is possibly the second worst brownstone on the planet. Um, so even if you were telling me you wanna replace all of the 
brownstone with cast stone, I would say, go ahead. If, you know, if, if, you, if you've got a, even a qualified crew mixing stucco, you're putting stucco on the differential and expansion and contraction that makes that stucco want to pop off. If the, if the guy who's mixing the stucco that, that day had a bad night last night, it's going to look different than yesterday's batch. There's so many ways that, that a stucco brownstone application can, can be bad and can fail. That as far as I'm concerned, it's bravo for using cast stone. It, it, it performs well. You can, you can match anything that you want, not only with color, but with texture. And so I think that's completely appropriate. The flagpoles, again, another, uh, I guess, unfortunate necessity. To me, it's just something else that's obscuring this, this building. But I understand that that's part of Part of the process of being a parks building. With regard to the railing, I think the statement was made that uh, the stainless steel is is there to match the flashing. I I really can't buy into that argument at all. I mean, flashing is is a necessity. It's not something that's uh, supposed to be beautiful. And to match lead coated copper, um, I think, is a mistake. I think it's a mistake to use brushed stainless steel for this railing. Uh, I think the statement was made that it's better than haphazard painting. Well, this is a building that deserves not haphazard painting, but a maintenance program that is good and a maintenance program that's followed. And so the railings and, and the pickets should be black and they should be painted. Um, I think that's about it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I'm in agree agreement with the, most of the comments, um, especially about the, uh, the front guardrail, I mean, the front step uh, rail. Uh, and also, I, I, I share uh, uh, Commissioner Diane's uh, comment about the state of the building and, and the concern, and, and Commissioner Devonshire eloquently expressed it. Um, I mean, uh, this is a very elegant structure, and I, I, I really hope. And I sympathize with the Parks Department as well as about, you know, the resources that needed to maintain this thing. But I do agree with the finish. I don't think uh, the stainless steel uh, is an appropriate uh, use here. And the, the entrance in terms of uh, the ramp, I, I guess, you know, if this is the only solution, I, uh, um, you know, we, we can grudgingly accept it, I guess. Okay. All right, and do you also ag agree with Commissioner Chapin that the uh, railing on the stairs should have pickets? Yes. Okay. And, and by the way, I have less problem with the flag poles. Uh, uh, that's the only area that differs slightly. Okay. All right, Commissioner Bland. Um, thank you. I arrived slightly late, but I think heard most of the presentation and all of the testimony, uh, which I found to be really troubling, but damning as well. Um, I was, I was going to suggest that we turn them back and have them, rather than a long drawn out conversation about where it might, the ramp might be placed in other places, just come back and show us why and where it doesn't work. But I'm persuaded perhaps now that um, others seem more, uh, uh, comfortable with the idea that there are not other places. But if there is a majority who feel that we should look at those other places before we uh, accept this one, I, I could go along in, in that direction. I think that's the main issue uh, for me is just, is there another place that this could be put? And I know the conundrum between providing access at the front as opposed to around a side, uh, but nonetheless, maybe we should know about that. Um, I, I would support the idea that's already been expressed of painting the pickets black and maintaining the paint on them. And um, I think the flagpole is okay with me too. It was really the placement of this ramp that I think is to me the nut of the problem. And I was, I, I'm not yet convinced personally that it 
that this is the right place for it. But if others are, I can go along with that as well. I mean, I, I think that it's the, uh, what is clear is it's the only place that will provide access to the primary facade oh, yeah, yeah. front entrance. Uh, well, and then it was stated that other locations would disrupt the uh, current layout of the interior significantly. And I, I think I would have to accept that it, as being a constraint. And potentially at the back, I guess, sort of reconfiguring the grade and the landscaping right. significantly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're just going on the word of a very confident team, but the word rather than showing us literally how, how it can't work. Yeah. But because um, of the testimony and the strength of it is, is what made me think we should look at it again rather than just say, oh, okay, it doesn't yeah. work, so therefore we accept this. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that all the community board uh, issues have been resolved favorably by them. So that, that, that shows you that others have looked at it and uh, have accepted it. Okay, thank you. I just wanna, Commissioner Devonshire, did you wanna add something to your comments? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to add that, that really, I agree with Fred. I, I would really feel much more comfortable if we could meet on site, I know that's a pain in the butt, but I, I, I would really like to be sure that there's not another alternative. I mean, you know, this, this park's front door to me, if, if there's some way to make another door more elegant, that would be much more equal as far as I'm concerned uh, toward entering this building. And, and frankly, if, if it, requires a little bit of reconfiguring spaces in the interior, that, that interior has been messed up already. And, and so if it would save the exterior, it would, if it would save this visage of the exterior, I would be very willing to spend some time and, and see what other alternatives there are. So I, I sort of agree with Fred on this. Okay. All right, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to echo a, a little bit of what uh, Michael Devonshire said, because I, I agree that ab about the overall um, condition of the building and others have said the same thing. And it's a little depressing to me. And I, I am a little sad. I completely understand that um, you know, it takes, it takes funds to be able to maintain these kinds of buildings. And I'm hopeful that at some point, um, those funds will be available to, to look at this building in a much uh, bigger picture way, holistically. There was mention of a master plan being developed. I'm very sorry that that master plan does not already exist because one of the things that I think is happening here and has been happening is that these small projects are coming before us and we're making these piecemeal decisions and um, we don't wanna make these decisions back into a master plan. In the best of all possible worlds, there's a master plan and then the building gets um, the things that have to happen, happen in a phased manner as the funding comes along. And so on some level, I don't feel comfortable at all <laughs> with what's going on here because I feel like it's not taking the total building into account. <laughs> um, I also agree with Michael that it's, it's really too bad that this stucco is no longer on this building because when I look at that, uh, the, the earlier photos of the building with the stucco on it, it was quite spectacular. And by the way, that front double, double door was lovely and I know it exists, I mean, apparently, and I'm not 100% sure why it can't be reinstalled, but I know it's not part of this project, but it would be nice to be thinking about those things once again um, from a bigger picture perspective. So, um, because this is an important building in this park, which is such an important park, not only in this borough, not only in this neighborhood and in this borough, but in this city. 
Um, okay, so now that I said that, and I hope the Alliance and the Parks Department think about that a little bit, when um, I think about some of these issues here, um, I would like to say that I, I agree that, oh, I'll start with the easy things. I don't have a problem with the flagpole. Um, they look fine, they're consistent with uh, what we generally see and approve on other buildings. So they don't seem to detract uh, in any way. Um, I, I think the, this whole, uh, let me, the cast stone, uh, especially when Michael Devonshire says he feels comfortable with the cast stone, I feel comfortable with the cast stone. Um, it's unfortunate that this ramp seems to have to be able to be here, um, but I can accept that. You know, maybe it wouldn't have been here if there was a master plan. Maybe it would have been somewhere else. I have no idea, but I can accept it. I think the, um, the railings do need to be painted. Uh, they need to be black. They need to be consistent with what else is uh, going on around the building at this moment. And then, you know, they need to be maintained. I know it's difficult, but that's you know what has to be done. I find the vertical pickets to be very distracting. If we have to have this ramp, they seem to get in the way of the facade of the building. And I think uh, one of the comments we received was that maybe there should be uh, just a, another horizontal bar that would take care of the guardrail issue and continue all the way down the ramp. And I think that visually would be more consistent and, and less uh, obtrusive. Did I leave anything out? No, I think you've covered everything, but I do think that the issue is, is it can't just be one horizontal bar. They have to be four inches between any members at the tallest point. That's the issue. That's the issue. Well. Then I don't know what the answer is. If that's all we can do, it's fine, but I don't think it looks great. Okay, we can look. Uh, I think there are other comments about the design. So I think that the design of the pickets and the placement of them can be restudied. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire on most of his argument. My argument really is the building type itself. And it had a base running on, uh, on three sides. And the ramp was put in following that base. But what, what makes it difficult for me is that even if you need the ramp and you have to have it here, then the, there shouldn't be any diagonal. It should not read at the ramp. It should read horizontally so that the planes echo the base and you penetrate that and you go in. I mean, I think making it, you know, with these diagonals mm -hmm. uh, doesn't follow the, well, you know what I mean. Yes. Second issue is the flagpoles. I mean, I, they're fine. I think they could be located at the ends because they take away from these beautiful sculptural elements at the stair. They, they conflict with it. They're too close. They should be somewhere else. They should, I mean, the entry, the, the beautiful, I don't know what they're called, the sculptural ornaments are beautiful and they should be standing alone by themselves. The flagpole should be somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I'm sort of tending towards wanting to see how it's some of the trials on other places to put the ramp. And for me, that does not necessarily mean a, a different entry point for uh, wheelchair um, visitors. I think it's about getting onto the terrace. So now that this may run into trouble around these issues of distances from the parking area or from entry for, um, for wheelchair access. But I still think that if there is a way to actually be on the ramp on the side of the building, switch back, double, triple, whatever it is, 
and then get onto the terrace, to a level terrace, level with the other terrace, with the, other, with the existing terrace, and be able to then on that terrace, um, uh, operate the wheelchair to the front, to the true front door. That would be better than actually having the ramp exactly at the same location as the entry steps. And so whether that's on the sort of, I'm not sure which side better um, you know, accommodates the switchbacking. It would be necessarily, I think, a shorter ramp distance. So maybe it would need more switchbacking. I'm not sure. But I guess my point is just to get us onto the terrace. And then from there, everyone enters the front door equally. So I would like to see that, I think. And I'm in agreement with other people, with other commissioners about the painted, I, I might propose even not black, but maybe a dark gray, but in any event, painted um, rail system. And I don't have a strong feeling, even though I, I, I accept others, um, uh, Commissioner Jefferson's about the flagpole. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford Smith. No, oh, you're muted, sorry. Okay. So a lot of comments have already been made about this. Um, I agree with the need for providing equal access. Um, and in theory, this is a good location for it as it does reference that original terrace, but it is, it does sort of take that apart. And I agree with um, Commissioner Jefferson with the diagonal expression, making that, you know, taking away from that original reading of the, of the, of the straight plinth. But I think if you try to, raise the wall behind and have it go and have it go parallel and not not ramp it would become very tall um so i'm not sure that that's a good solution either um i would love to find another solution somewhere on the house on the building i don't know if, you know what we talked about it doesn't seem like that's really a possibility but, um, given that's where we are now um i agree that the railing uh, and the guardrail are not appropriate and I've been thinking about it. And if the, the railing on the stairs and the ramp were a more traditional painted metal railing, I wonder if the guard portion could be a mesh that was sort of placed in between um, that maybe you wouldn't see it. Um, you know, the top portion of it could be open above the handrail and the body of it could be a, perhaps be a mesh that might just disappear. I don't know, it's something to be, to be um, explored. Um, and I think that I'm okay with the location of the flagpoles. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you commissioners for all of your comments. We, um, we won't take an action today because I think there are many of you who want to be convinced that there aren't an, other options or another alternative to get to a primary entrance, whether it's sort of up onto the terrace to this entrance or converting something else to a, an equal primary entrance. So I think we'll ask the applicants to come back and address the alternatives. And in the meantime, we've given them some, I think, really good suggestions about the detailing for the railings and, um, and you know, even thinking about the diagonal of the ramp and how that's expressed. Um, and, I, and I do actually think one way, to, I agree with Commissioner Holford Smith that actually, if you did a sort of consistent traditional railing um, that was, more open and then did a kind of mesh at the guardrail. It might just read as not ironwork and something different that recedes and if not kind of disappears in some views, depending on the light. So that may be something to explore. So I think we have, um, we'd like to see and be convinced that there are, there aren't, aren't other alternatives. And then we also, if this is the, it turns out to be the best location, I think we have some good design suggestions that have been made in our comments. Commissioner Chapin, did you wanna add something? Uh, yeah, uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the possibility of a lift, um, which, you know, with the, you know, the wall that was originally there, you know, you, anyway, the, the question is whether that might conceivably be less intrusive, but, you know, just if they're looking at alternatives. Yep. 
Okay, we can add that to it, to the X. And so we'll have them come back and, and give us a presentation on those different alternatives. And, um, and, and uh, we'll do that as quickly as they can. So thank you all for your comments and we will um, move on to the next item. Okay, so we'll be moving to public hearing item number two, LPC 21-00211. Application for a binding report in the Borough of Manhattan, Block 582, Lot 50, 1 Clarkson Street, AKA 2 to 8 7th Avenue South in the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2. This is a colonial revival style public bathhouse designed by Renwick, Aspinwall, and Tucker, built in 1906 to 07, and altered by Jaros Krauss in 1922 and Mitchell Bernstein in 1929. And the application is to reconstruct an entrance ramp and stairs. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, ben, you now have control of the presentation. If you just want to click on your screen, use your arrow keys to advance the slides. State your name for the record and you may begin. Ben, um, you're muted. Apologize about that. My name is Benjamin Conable. I'm an engineer with New York City Parks. And I am attempting to advance the slides, but they're not advancing. So Benjamin, you just need to click on the screen first, and then you can advance the slides. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I'm here to present the reconstruction of the stair and ramp at 1 Clarkson Street in the West Village, which is part of Tony Dapolito Recreation Center. The work is in conjunction with a larger project that is the sidewalk fault reconstruction. 1 Clarkson Street is located in uh, the West Village in the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension. Uh, again, it's part of a larger project. You can see uh, the brown box on the right-hand side of your screen. That is the 7th Avenue South sidewalk fault that we need to reconstruct because it's derelict. Um, in addition to that, we're resurfacing the sidewalk um, in front of the facility, in front of the outdoor pool, and for a section of uh, 30 feet in front of J.J. Walker Park. And then, of course, reconstructing the stair and ramp at the main entrance of the recreation center. On the left, you can see the original facade from 1908 for the Carmine Street Baths. Um, I'd like to draw attention to the three stair entrances, a main central stair front facing, and two side entrances um, with side facing stairs that we believe went to locker room facilities. Uh, we don't have original drawings for the building, um, except for a few related to Gustavine Arches that are not relevant. Uh, I'd like to point out the two rail pipe rail handrails on the side stairs, as well as the uh, overhanging tread detail on the side stairs. On the right-hand side, we can see the facade as it exists today, uh, including with the current stair and ramp. Um, describing the changes to the facade over time, uh, they happened twice, as was mentioned at the beginning, in 1922 with the realignment of 7th Avenue South for the 7th Avenue sidewalk, uh, sorry, excuse me, subway. A corner of the building was removed and another corner was added. And then in 1929, an indoor pool was added to the facility uh, with its facade to the west of the historic facade. Here we see those two facades again. Uh, this is kind of a wayfinding slide. The two orange boxes overlap. In the historic image, you can see uh, where the east portion of the historic facade was trimmed where the dormer was removed, uh, where the tower mass at the top was moved over and reconstructed. And then on the left-hand side, uh, the additional mass behind which is the indoor pool. Uh, and then on the right-hand side where you can see that orange box, we can identify that the main entrance has been shifted over one arch um, so that one of those side entrances is taken over as the main entrance and the original main entrance has been closed. Um, you forgive us for the 
uh, having to look through layers of paint to identify that the base of the building here is a gray granite, uh, the, the entire building skirt, and that matches also a secondary entrance stair, a two-step stair on the west side, of, on the 7th Avenue south side of the building. Um, and here we see the 1982 current stair and ramp uh, with its curved aspect, its thin, dark gray granite stone veneers, uh, three rails, stainless steel handrails. And, and I wanna focus on, on a couple of things, especially about the ramp. The way that this was built, the entrance to the ramp is against the building, which means as a person progresses up the ramp, when they get to this, what we'll describe as the sidewalk side, the cheek walls of the ramp are quite high, as you can see with this person actually walking next to them. And uh, that projecting high walled ramp uh, blocks some view to the facade and also blocks view to the main stair, uh, especially from the primary access at the corner of 7th Avenue South of Clarkson Street. Uh, that, uh, I point out that this, uh, the construction of that stair and ramp was before the designation of the Landmark District Extension. Here we can see the current condition of the stair and ramp uh, with a thin stone veneer that's broken and displaced in a number of places. Here's a layout of the existing stair again. The point, one of the points here being that the that ramp really projects past the stair and uh, and is very tall in its, in its aspect. And here's our proposed uh, stair and ramp replacement with the main stair widened and centered on the entrance, a secondary stair from the Clarkson Street approach that recollects the historic secondary stair, a new ramp layout which minimizes visual impact, or let's say balances the impact of the two approaches, and a general low profile of the of this stair and ramp facility which provides for good health, safety, and maintenance um, as we use our facility. Apologies, I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. Uh, just to show an overlay of the two, the existing and the proposed. Again, we can see that the ramp is able is uh, set back to align with the cheek walls of the stair. And we've managed to expand the landing, uh, which is actually um, a bit of a safety issue for uh, wheeled users as they come off of the existing ramp if the eastmost door is open, they have to get pretty close to the stair edge. So we've actually expanded the landing and made that an easier approach uh, that we think is an improvement for users. And now we get to a rendering. Here's a rendering of our proposed uh, uh, stair and ramp from the 7th Avenue South and Clarkson Street corner. As we approach, we can see a two rail handrail uh, where needed and in uh, black pipe rail. We're proposing that the ramp uh, swearing surface be a plain concrete to match the sidewalk only for the extent of the ramp uh, that could be replaced as the sidewalk is replaced in the future. And for all other surfaces, uh, the stair treads, the cheek walls uh, throughout and the stair land um, in a gray granite to match the base of the building and the stairs as they exist on South Avenue. Um, to uh, determine exactly what that granite is, in construction, we're proposing to have the contractor clean and match, and then obviously we would present that material um, for approval at the staff level. Um, from the more of the Clarkson Street approach side, we can see on the left-hand side, the Clarkson Street stairs with an overhanging tread detail. And in the coursing on the stone of the cheek walls, a reveal below the caps, below a solid capstone that uh, again is reminiscent of the of the historic condition without expanding the ramp. Um, uh, the, we're minimizing to the extent possible the clutter of the railings, um, except in places where we're using that two rail handrail to match uh, the historic condition. Uh, our front facing rendering, including uh, the, symmet the symmetric front stairs. And uh, this is my ending slide. Uh, again, the proposed and the current condition. 
While we can't replicate the historic stairs due to code and to the changes in the facade, uh, we believe we've developed a design that's appropriate for the historic building and evocative of the historic stair in material and form. Uh, we've improved on the existing conditions with the new design, including by reducing the footprint of the ramp while improving ramp user experience. And finally, our design has opened up the view to the historic facade uh, to the extent possible. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we already have some questions. So let's go ahead. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so the question I have is whether or not, and, I, and you may have said this, the, the ramp, this is sort of related to the previous project, can um, uh, happen at the sort of the newer part of the building to the left at the square door rather than at the arch door. And I guess the, I mean, there's probably still an interiors issue of where that leads you, but did, uh, just to clarify for me, I'm sorry if I've missed something and if that was already explored. Can, can I confirm that your question is whether it's possible to flip the ramp to the Clarkson Street side of the stairs? Is that what you mean? Flip and potentially um, extend you know, further to the, to, the, to the other side. So in the, if I, um, the ramp, if it's a switchback ramp, uh, would completely block the sidewalk on that side. We did look at that as a possibility if, it could be, if the ramp could be on the left of the main stair mm -hmm. and it, 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 it can't, it, as a switchback, it blocks it. If it was a straight run, it would block the, there's an exit from an, a sidewalk exit from the swimming pool. Um, and, and again, that on Clarkson street, I don't have a, I don't have a photo of this, but on Clarkson street, the sidewalk is quite narrow. It's a, just a five foot sidewalk before you get the tree pits. And so if, if we, depending on how far that ramp went, it would actually become the sidewalk in some way and completely block. So in both a switchback and a straight run circumstance, um, the ramp on the left-hand side is not, uh, is not feasible. Okay. Thanks. All right. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. So we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on the item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance. And if you signed up in advance, also raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Kersavage to take us through the testimony. Okay, great, thank you. We had one person sign up, uh, George Calderaro. Hey, George. Hello again, commissioners, George Calderborough, chair of the Preservation Committee of the Victorian Society, New York. The Victorian Society will not comment on the coincidence of a second parks department project so similar in outline to the previous one at Litchfield Billet. Here again, we have a proposal for constructing a new ramp and stair at a building that based on extensive black netting is in serious disrepair with perhaps more pressing needs than a replacement ramp and stair. In this case, the building is not as significant and in fact has been rather severely altered. The proposed ramp and stair are a more harmonious fit with the building in form and materials than the existing, and we recommend that the proposal be found appropriate. However, we urge the addition of two masonry piers flanking the main stage as shown in one of the rejected options. We feel that a pair of these piers, which existed historically, would help emphasize the central entrance and break up the extensive expanse of pipe railing. The piers needn't be as tall as drawn in the rejected opinion, but should be scaled more like those seen in the 1908 photograph. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll just note that um, Manhattan Community Board 2 recommended approval of the application as presented as well. Um, so. I'd like to turn back to the applicants and see if they'd like to respond at all. Um, I think I uh, would, in, in having a, so we did look at uh, a few different options for those peers uh, in addition to the one 
that's shown in the appendix. Of, um, and I think the thing that we identified is that in order for that, that, that a funny thing happens at the corner of the ramp and the stair where that pier, if it's scaled if shorter or taller, but if it's scaled similar to the way that it was in the historic slide, it impedes on the ramp and forces us to either have um, a detail where the pier has a corner taken out of the backside or uh, the geometry start to shift around and things get, and things get bigger. In addition to that, um, those piers, even when low, block the view of the stair um, in a way that, that we thought was uh, counterproductive and losing an opportunity to open up the view to the access so that users are coming in and they're seeing the access. They're seeing the way that they're getting into the building and that those accesses are balanced. So that's our, the reason that we took them out um, in addition to the fact that, and I agree with the comment that these are taller than, than would be um, needed, but, but we took them out completely because we're not reconstructing a historic condition. The historic part of this facility is really the facade, even in its altered state from 1922 and 1929. And so our, our attempt is to make a minimal um, uh, visual impact uh, while still referencing in some way to the extent possible the historic condition. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Chapin, please go ahead. Yeah, just to clarify, I, I think, I don't know if the comment uh, by the uh, um, before was, but was uh, including, I think they didn't mean to include that uh, corner pillar, but I think you're saying that you still feel that <clears throat> even if you just had two pillars, one on each side of the door, one, it would not replicate the historic condition because you don't have the uh, like lampposts on top of it but also that it would be, uh, it would still block a view of the stairs from the side, even though it is, um, if you try to kind of come as close as possible to rec replicating the historic piers that were on, on both sides of the stairs, you felt that, you know, it's blocking the view of the stairs. Is that your comment? Uh, yes, but in addition, the west pier of the stairs, um, as you're facing the building, the pier on the right of the stairs, yeah. at scale, the back corner invades the ramp area. And so there becomes a, there becomes a condition where if, if that back corner is, is or, or they project out, um, they, they project out even further into the sidewalk and, and that, that neither one of those things is a goal for us. Um, and so, uh, we liked the simplicity and, and reduction in elements of the of the project as it ended up. Thank you. Right, and I think it not only doesn't restore it in terms of the the decorative feature on top, but also its planar relationship to the stairs isn't really restored either because of the configuration of the ramp. So they just sort of become um, sort of these visual pillars that. Um, maybe don't have the same meaning they, the original ones had. Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. I, I may have missed this, so I'd appreciate, you know, so sorry, but um, what is the materiality? Uh, I'm assuming these are glass doors in the front and then what's the materiality around it that's framing it? Uh, the door is a steel door with a glass panel. Do I have, I don't believe I have control of the screen anymore, but if, if, it, let me see if I do. Just tell me, you can tell me what slide it is because I can go to it. Thank you. I, it's slide, it's probably slide four. Slide four. The historic to the existing. I hear, I hear they're visible. Uh, so, that, so here, here you can see there's steel doors with uh, with safety glass lights. At the back. So there's going to be a, a cutout for a window in the door. We're or not we're not touching or replacing the doors. 
Oh, you're not. They're no. going to be exactly the same. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. No, nor any other part of the facade. Okay. All right. Because they read a little visually when you look at your a plan, they, they read a little differently than how they. Yes, I apologize for the renderings. I understand that it's preferred to have a photograph backdrop for the renderings, but that was not achieved. Okay. I got it. So thank you. Okay. Great. Any other final questions? All right, we're gonna move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So, um, Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, this is again, another ramp. This is a, a situation where the front of this building has been altered and there's this modern ramp and the application is to replace it with a new ramp. Um, and we'll start with Commissioner Devonshire. Would you start this one? Sure, I think it's much improved. Um, I can approve this. Commissioner Chen. Uh, likewise, yeah. Commissioner Bland. Yeah, likewise, and I think what I like about this as opposed to the existing, which is kind of a mess of uh, two different systems kind of colliding, is now, now is one unified and unitary system of stair and ramp. And I think it's, uh, it's wholesale, uh, wholesale replacement in front of this altered building is appropriate. <clears throat> Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I think the railings need to be restudied. They're, they're a bit heavy and clumsy, but it's appropriate. But the railing should be studied. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Holford Smith. I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with other commissioners that it's appropriate and they've given us uh, the alternatives. And I think this is a cleaner version and, uh, you know, somewhat rep reminiscent of the original uh, stair, stair uh, you know, additions that were on the building originally. So I'm fine with it. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have enough to approve it as is. Um, I know Commissioner Jefferson has asked that they'd restudy the, the heaviness of the railings and they can do that voluntarily, but we'll make a motion to approve it as presented. Commissioner Devonshire, would you do that? Yeah, just let's, yeah. All right, sir. In the manner of one Clarkson Street, also known as two to eight Seventh <laughs> Avenue South, Greenwich Village, historic district extension two, I recommend. Um, sorry, an application to reconstruct an entrance ramp and stairs. Um, I recommend issuing a positive report finding that the work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. The work will maintain barrier free access as a primary entrance, while also eliminating a modern assembly that detracts from the historic character of the building. That the Clarkson Street facade was modified in the early 20th century, precluding the possible restoration of the original stairs within their historic context. That the simple de details, oh. sorry, that the simple details and rectilinear footprint of the ramp and stairs will be compatible with the building design and will not draw undue attention away from its significant historic features. That the profiles of the side stair will recall aspects of the historic stairs. That the proposed granite will match the existing material and finish of the granite at the building base, helping to support a unified composition if the existing paint is removed in the future. That the concrete ramp Paving will match the adjoining sidewalk paving in terms of material and finish, thereby harmonizing with its context. And that the proposed pipe rails will be typical in terms of placement, size, material, and finish. Okay. And okay. yes, Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? 
I got it. All right. And Mark, will you call the vote? Um, yes. Um, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Commissioner Shamir Barron. She's still on. I can't. Let's see. She seems. Well, I'll come back to her. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Nay. Uh, Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With um, seven in favor, one opposed, and one not present, the motion passes. Okay, so it's approved. Um, thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 22-01500. Application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 510, lot 7502, 275 Mulberry Street, the Puck Building individual landmark. This is a Romanesque revival style commercial building designed by Albert Wagner built in 1885 to 86 with alterations in 1892 to 93 and 1897 to 99. And the application is to install an awning, flagpole, and signage, and to create a vitrine. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Garrett, you now have control over the presentation. Just click on your screen and then use your arrow keys to advance the slides. Be sure to state your name for the record and you may begin. Make sure, uh, can you guys hear me? <clears throat> Hello? Yes, we can uh, hear you. Please go ahead. My name is Garrett Singer. I'm the architect and applicant for 275 Mulberry Street. Um, and let's jump right into the presentation. So I click once and then, oh, I see. If I want to go backwards, I won't go backwards. You can just use your arrow keys to go backwards. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, Today, we are presenting uh, some elements that we'd like to add to the exterior of the Puck Building. I'm sure everyone is very familiar with this building. The portion of the building that we are talking about is the southernmost portion. Um, it formerly was a restaurant called the Chef's Club. It's now going to become a new restaurant. Uh, the new owners have discussed some you know, program plans with the building that, that affect what we want to do design-wise. The areas of the building are the... the uh, east southernmost part of the building and the west southernmost part of the building. Um, and then you can see that on the plan here. Do you guys see my cursor moving? I just wanna know if I'm pointing to something, you see that. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, on the next couple of slides, we have historic photos of the building. Um, I don't know if this has the ability to zoom, but I have another slide that will follow up. Uh, on the slide on the left, uh, two significant things are, you see the old superior printing sign and how it is mounted on the facade. And you see in a shadow line, which we blow up on the next slide, um, a covered entranceway, a, a protected awning of some sort. And then this is now standing um, south of the building on Mulberry Street, looking at our corner of the project. And again, there is another outline of that projected awning. And I'll go to the next. Okay, so on this close up slide, um, you can see that projected awning. Um, it's, uh, it, it's hard to tell exactly what the construction of that awning is made of, uh, but there's just evidence of the awning um, there. And then this is, oh, sorry, this is a historic photo of uh, across the street. Now, this is from the 1980, I think it was the 85 series of the tax photos. Um, it just shows some, some examples of what's directly across the building um, in terms of, of you know, context of, of our project. Oh, sorry, one more thing. I want to go back one slide. Um, if you look at the, sorry, I'm looking for the right slide. The lower portion of the next couple of slides, you will see not just the um, 
the, the original signage on the exterior of the building, but you'll also see that there is a series of signage in all of the windows. Um, and then you can see that here on this slide. In the upper image, um, you'll see these black placards with white letters and what looks like um, drapery behind it. Um, and then you can see in this photo, uh, still um, probably circa 80s has, I guess, a much brighter or a different signage directly in those windows displaying sort of the business behind there. Slide shows in plan uh, to orient you. This is Jersey Street. This is our main entrance on Mulberry Street adjacent to the fire uh, egress of the entire building. And then on Lafayette, this is the area where we are proposing um, signage and the vitrine as well. This slide illustrates both elevations of Mulberry and Lafayette. On the left outlined is the existing condition of, of our facade in Mulberry. And on Lafayette, we are discussing the far south on the right over here, that elevation. Next slide is a close-up of 275 Mulberry. This is the, the southeast corner. This is the current condition that it's in right now. Um, and the next slide shows our proposed awning and signage van. Next slide is just an existing condition uh, uh, 2D drawing and a detailed drawing of the elevation of showing, again, the proposed signage and the proposed uh, awning. Uh, I'll start off by talking about in detail the signage. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing quite a few landmarks projects with you guys. Um, and what I've learned in the past is that if there is an established language even though it might not be the historic one on the building, that that generally is what the, you know we'd like to keep that same language going around the building. So we were able to um, get our hands on what REI was approved, um, and we're proposing the same system with two possible, well, one definite modification, which is our signage will be a little bit more rounded. It'll have a little bit more of that that historic feel, and the letters will be gold, uh, gold leaf painted as well. Um, it won't be like the flat machine version like REI has. The other um, item that we have discussed with our staff members is when we engineer this, if there's a way with today's materials to make those bands lighter, that we would do that as well. Next slide shows a section of where the, um, the sign would be mounted. The sign is mounted on the side into the brick and it would be embedded into the mortar joints. Um, and then you're also starting to see the first section of the proposed awning. Um, and I'm gonna get into some detail on the awning in a minute, um, but I'm gonna start with this position. Um, so first off, the awning that we have selected that we'd like to install is from a company in UK called, uh, and it was United Awning. Company's been in business since the late 1800s. It's an original awning manufacturer. I know after doing this many years and working with, with LPC that, there's a challenge with proposing an element like this on a building like this and finding the right balance and where that belongs. Um, this building was designed and its purposes then, you know, are obviously used quite differently than they are today. And that um, we think adding an awning sort of, if you think of the Puck building as the first building that you really pass as you come into Mulberry, and then the scale of Mulberry starts to come down and you think of really what Mulberry, you know, used to look like with those long sloping awnings going through, we feel like this is like a nice little sort of like from the scale of the puck building that sort of brings you right down and starts that pedestrian scale as you go down Mulberry. So we think it's appropriate um, when you see some of the other images we have of the design, I think you'll, you'll hopefully agree. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we worked with the staff on was where's the appropriate place to, to, to put this awning? because there's all this wonderful detail. There are these you know, beautiful cast iron uh, pilasters that are part of the facade. Um, and so what we chose was to, to put it just at the top of the scroll here, but enough in a position where we can still manage water properly and everything can run off. Um, the, I have some additional close-ups of that. This is a, uh, a quick drawing that we received from the owning company. Um, I have some additional images in the appendix if you'd like to see the details, but the, um, the, the, the part that holds the valance is a mahogany, which is painted to match our color. 
You have the old style arms. There is a chain mechanism. We even opted to go with the crank system versus motorized, even though we can do motorized, so that it's not even just we want this to have the charm of the neighborhood, but we want at you know 8 a.m. in the morning to have someone out there you know with the crank and oh you know whether at night closing it or opening it, it, it sort of I think plays well into the narrative. Um, it's the next slide. Um, Here's a good shot that shows what you would see as a pedestrian if you were looking up at, at the architecture, what, what you'd be seeing. And then on the right, we superimpose the awning. And you can see where we chose a position to sort of, it feels almost natural as if those scrolls hold the wood box that holds the old roller inside of there. Um, and so we thought that that was a really nice solution for that. The next request is on the Lafayette side. So on the Lafayette side, um, we have three windows. And um, as you can imagine, the tenant would like to take advantage of, you know, um, providing some attention to the street, to the concept um, for multiple reasons. First and foremost, the entrance is actually down uh, Jersey and on Mulberry. And so it, they're looking for a way to communicate to people that there is a restaurant back here. Um, but there, there is a history both in the past of, let's say, Mulberry Street, Mott Street, where you have these storefronts that have these, um, you know, the, you guys are referring to as a vitrine, but they have these display shelves and they display their goods. Or in the Italian area, you know, they would be displaying the foods or specialty menus and things like that. Um, and I think that's what we're proposing. And I'm gonna show you on the next slide. So here you can see the Terezi name again installed in the same manner as the other signage in the building. And then you get to see, um, actually gonna go in here will be developed seasonally. They, they have a professional who will be filling this window, just like any retail window. Um, but what's interesting about this is that not only does this speak at least to the history of a part of this neighborhood, but this neighborhood today is also a part of history. And this neighborhood, when you walk up and down this street, is all retail, it's all display in the windows. So we think, again, this is also like a really, you know, interesting juxtaposition of going from the Puck building into Soho um, and starting to see goods on display. Next slide just shows the existing condition in 2D. And the slide after that is the 2D showing the proposed uh, signage, um, band up above. And then the third item that we're asking for is the uh, flagpole. So this is the facade of Lafayette and currently right now there are two existing flagpoles on this building. And then um, I won't go into the appendix unless you ask, but if you just walk down Broadway and photograph both north and south, you will see you know, several different types of flagpoles. Um, and I think again, that there is this uh, rhythm and cadence of the neighborhood that has these elements hanging down that I think add to the charm of, of this part of New York City. Um, so we're, we're looking to have that sign here we think that's probably our best bet at sort of grabbing attention to sort of indicate that the restaurant is around the corner. Um, and, uh, and that's just about our presentation. I think the last thing is the, uh, just some information on the display area. Um, currently there are boxed out non-historic wood uh, like extensions of the existing pilasters. We're extending those an additional six inches will be a total of 30 inches away from the window. Our back window, we were inspired by other um, old uh, delis and butcher shops that we saw in historic photos, which I have images if you'd like to see, um, with a wood frame and glass uh, opening. You'll see one second. So those doors will have the ability to open up so they can go in and modify the display as needed, but they'll also allow natural light into the space. And here's a view of sort of like a pedestrian looking up at it. 
Um, we were we had presented a, uh, a recessed downlight in, in the center, but the project just received permission to do demo a few days ago, and they demoed what was covering up an existing ceiling, and there is an existing trough built up inside of you. We did not have time to show you that. It already has a hidden light feature that can't, you know, that there, there's no visual vantage point of it. And we're just going to reuse that. I'm not going to introduce a new light source. We're just going to use that as our light source. Uh, and then just real quickly in the appendix, you know, this is the charm of, of lower Manhattan, um, specifically in the Nolita area. And, uh, you know, we, we feel that these, you know, kind of slightly sloped old awnings um, add to the character of the neighborhood. And um, there are even some buildings that have the same scale as the Puck building that have examples of awnings as well on them. So it's not, you know, an individual situation. Um, these are just photos looking down Broadway, different areas, flag, flag, you know, flags, a flag, 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 all the way down, more flags, um, and some are banners. Um, and again, I know that these, that, that some of these are sort of, um, harder ass, but I feel like in the context of this neighborhood, this is just becoming part of that that fabric and not detracting from it. I don't think. Um, and then lastly, just a couple more historic photos of Mulberry Street, showing you the retracted awnings um, and the you know the different display windows that you would see there. Um, and we would like to bring that character back as well. And then this is the pre-approved landmarks um, for, uh, for REI. This was their submission. So we followed that exactly. And then lastly here, are just some 3D shots, just to give you just a better feel of what that awning looks like versus the, the uh, photograph we showed earlier. And just examples of the awning company that we're using and the quality of the material. That's it. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. So why don't we move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And as always, we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance and I will turn it over to Lisa Kersavich to take us through the testimony. Okay, um, and John Graham uh, signed up in advance, so we'll start with him. Oops. John, brought you in. Good morning, commissioners. John Graham from VSNY. The Victorian Society in New York supports certain aspects of the proposal, but finds others to be inappropriate. The proposed cutout sign over the spandrel panel, provided it isn't illuminated, appears to conform both to historic signs on the building and to similar existing signs. While they partially obscure the decorative spandrel panel, we find that on the whole, these signs, including the one proposed, are supportive of the building's character. In addition, the proposed painted lettering on the glass is minimal and unobtrusive. We also find the proposed vitrines appropriate as they are located behind the storefront glass and are a simple variant on typical window displays. However, we find both the flagpole and banner and the retractable awning to be inappropriate and recommend denial of these features. This is not a building which should become covered with flagpoles and banners. They appear not to have existed historically, and there are only two others shown on the building now, and we aren't sure that those have been approved. In addition, the proposed third floor location is too far removed from the ground floor use. Similarly, the building doesn't now and didn't historically have awnings retractable or otherwise. The 1935 tax photo the applicant shows on board four does not appear to show an awning. It's a canopy, possibly over service entrance, and that should not be seen as a precedent for an awning. Having one such awning would either be an anomaly or a bad precedent. The detail of the storefront infill requires that the awning box project from the plane of the facade, which would be awkward. Finally, the installation of the return brickwork 
would likely be quite destructive, even with attempts to affix the supports to mortar joints. Putting anchors into the narrow joints of this building's brickwork would likely result in two damaged bricks per hole. Thank you very much, commissioners. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have um, Diego Rubio. Hi everyone, my name is Diego Roballo and I work for the Historic Districts Council. HDC asks that the proposed zoning be rejected as it interferes with an otherwise completely uniform trans transom condition across the building facade. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Okay, great, thank you. And I'll just note, for the record that uh, Manhattan Community Board 2 recommended approval of the application provided that the historic details of the sign band are not obscured and that there be no interior structure within 18 inches of the vitrine window. Okay, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant and see if you would like to respond to the comments we've heard, um, both the recommendations from the community board as well as the comments we've heard in public testimony from um, the Historic Districts Council and Victorian Society, particularly with respect to the awning, its attachment, um, potential damage to historic fabric or obscuring historic fabric and the flagpoles. Yeah, I think there is precedent for attaching to the building in a manner that um, can preserve it um, and or be repaired. And I think that that's been proven multiple times. And I don't, I think that shouldn't be the reason not to do this because I think there's ample opportunity, even just the length of the arm that attaches um, gives it enough resistance that each mortar joint doesn't have to resist the typical torque of, of a maybe like small connection. Um, the question of how to deal with this facade in terms of, you know, you have, uh, you have this rhythm and cadence going down that, that um, uh, it doesn't have something like this there. But that when you reference the um, uh, canopy, right, like the canopy had a purpose and it was entitled to be used for its purpose for what it was needed at the time. If the Puck building at the, you know, at the time when it was built, Soho was a hot bustling area and restaurants were moving in. Um, the type of awning and the way that we're proposing it is probably very likely something that you would see. Um, and I think what makes this unique is that it is the, it's like the far back corner of this building. Like all the iconic shots of this building, are, you know, or the architecture are, are really truly Lafayette's facade. And this is almost at the end where it's you know borderline the service entrance of the building on Jersey Street, and so you know as an architect I appreciate those comments and I, and I understand those comments, um, but I don't think that they warrant enough that the addition of this would impact the way we all appreciate this building as New Yorkers. Um, I don't think it takes away from it at all. Uh, you know maybe a bigger argument if if this were on Lafayette and it was in bay number three, and it was like sort of just happening in the middle of nothing. But, you know, what happens if for some reason REI goes out and they decide, wow, restaurants are great, and I want to open up multiple restaurants across here. Having that awning, having that, that, that is part of having a proper restaurant. That's part of having, being able to have outdoor seating, which is something that we all really need right now these days, especially, you know, something to protect from the elements. Um, so I, I do get the challenge. Of, of the awning uh, on this facade. Um, but I think the solution that we provided was very carefully thought through to sort of make it work as good as it, you know, should on a building like this. Okay. All right, other comments or questions, commissioners? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So I am starting to unmute or request to unmute you so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay, and Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 
Yes or whatever. Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So we have um, multiple components here. We have the signage um, on, the, on the bars uh, that is gold leaf. And then we have the awning in the one bay, the vitrine in one bay and the flagpole on the facade. So um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you start this one? Sure. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is this is a very exciting project, <laughs> and it was a good presentation. Thank you. That said, um, I feel like the awning is not consistent uh, with what's been here on the facade of the building from the historically or currently with respect to uh, the the current tenants. I think it, it would unfortunately hide some of the detail, the cast iron detail um, on the facade. And so I, I don't think I could approve that. Um, I also don't think the flag pole is appropriate. I think the applicant has done a very good job of distinguishing the retail unit with the, um, signage both <clears throat> at the at the the uh, on the signage bar and it has a nice flourish and uh, a little tilt to it and also there's going to be signage um, on the windows and the vitrine will also call attention to the to the restaurant and um, I, I think that should be sufficient okay thank you Commissioner Jefferson. Ah, yes. Um, I think the argument for um, for the awning was not compelling enough, since there isn't on that facade. There isn't any other awning, so I'm opposed to opposed to the awning. The flagpole um, at the corner of the building. It, 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 Sitting at the corners was didn't make any sense to me, so I'm opposed to that. Um, uh, signage is appropriate, and the vitrine is appropriate. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, um, I think that the uh, vitrine, the flagpole, and the gold leaf lettering are all appropriate um, and and suit the building and. Uh, I do though have a problem with the awning if for the reasons that others have described, which is that there are not others uh, awnings here, but I think more, uh, and while this location on Mulberry is the most kind of not um, iconic or visible, you know, known to be the kind of the puck building, the location is, is could be um, a case for why one would think one lone canopy would be all right. But I actually think my bigger problem with it has to do with the, the definition of the, of the entire sort of opening bay and the, the way that the actual storefront is constructed, which is that those internal piers don't really allow for um, a kind of, for, for an awning or any kind of additional element to, to really span them. And I think a way that is that is neat or or makes sense, meaning that let's say might I be able to consider awning sort of three discrete awnings underneath the kind of the beam itself between those piers, um, that would make kind of structurally a little bit more or formally a little bit more sense to me. But in any event, I can't support and don't think uh, the awning as it's proposed right now is appropriate. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree with most of the uh, comments already made. Um, I think that the awning is uh, disruptive of the reading of the entire storefront bay, which is the entire arched um, opening that spans two floors. The awning just cuts it in half. Um, I think that the, the signage is fine and the vitrines are fine. Uh, and I also do not think the flagpole is appropriate. All right, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, um, I think that the vitrine is fine, the signage is fine. I do not think that the flagpole is appropriate in this location. 
And I also think the awning is not, you know, there because there aren't any other awnings on the, on this building. I think it isn't appropriate. I do think that I would be okay with something like a canopy over the door for weather protection or a, a small awning that fit between the uh, the uh, cast iron piers. Uh, I don't think that three of them are necessary if you're really looking for just you know, calling out the building entrance and providing a little rain shelter. So, but I would be okay with uh, one over the door. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Um, signage, yes. Um, vitrine, yes. Awning, no. Flagpole, no. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I'm in agreement with the testimony as, uh, as well as uh, the commissioner's comment. I, I agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Chapin that uh, you know uh, the if if it need to be, there should be just a small narrow uh, for rain or weather protection in the center of the door if if there's enough support for it. Okay, and Commissioner Bland, uh, bringing up the rear and the minority. Um, okay with the vitrine, okay with the um, signage, not okay with the flag. And let me just point out that uh, awnings like this, particularly in, in their European derivation, always had a function. Uh, and the function was usually to provide shade and uh, the retractable nature of it, which was described as uh, thoughtful, uh, of course, and it goes up, it goes down. Uh, as the sun is uh, either on or not on the shop front. Uh, the applicant didn't make that point at all and did make the point that maybe eating outside the restaurant, but I can't see looking at this how one could really put tables there, at least in any quantity that would make sense uh, with the stairs and all. So um, I guess I'm saying, I don't think that, I mean, this building is so incredibly robust, these huge brick buttresses, um, the awning fitting between them nicely. I think an awning is not necessarily inappropriate in this building, particularly the note that it has a multiple uh, use, um, you know, different, uh, it's not just one use, uh, retail use here, it's many different uses uh, and, and, uh, and um, uh, stores, etc. But given all of that, and I'm sorry to go on about it, uh, I might have been persuaded, but I think since it doesn't, it seems to be just a one-off and maybe like a sign only, uh, I guess I'm joining the majority ultimately in uh, denying uh, the appropriateness of the awning. <clears throat> okay, all right, thank you. And I, you know, I appreciate your comments because I know that even historically we have seen awnings on sort of virtually every building type that we have review and regulate. And they were used um, throughout, you know, as I said, throughout the city and different building types, primarily for shade and for signage in the case of storefronts. But again, in those cases, it was for shade as well. And so um, we see them on upper floors, we see them on ground floors. Um, I do think that the, you know, other commissioners have raised some good points about the fact that it's sort of a one-off here. And I do, um, think that there's a, a sort of a structural problem within this bay, sort of addressing the pilasters and the the uh, tripartite configuration of this bay. So, um, in any event, we don't have enough votes for the awning, um, and it seems that the majority of people are not comfortable with the flagpole either. So we'll go ahead and make a motion to approve all other components of the application and not the flagpole and not the awning. And should the applicant like to want to uh, explore other options for an awning as some commissioners suggested, they can come back to us with that. But we'll go ahead and, and do a motion today. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you read that motion? Sure. In the matter of docket 22-01500, <clears throat> Mulberry Street, the Puck Building Individual Landmark. A Romanesque revival style commercial building designed by Albert Wagner and built in 1885-86 with alterations in 1892-93 and 1897-99 
the application is to install an awning, flagpole, and signage, and to create a vitrine. I recommend approval with modifications finding that the placement of signage in front of the spandrels will be in keeping with historic precedent for signage at this building and will obscure only one of the decorative spandrels at this large building. That the proposed signage will be anchored at plain masonry and will be in keeping with existing signage previously approved by the commission at other bays in terms of placement size and installation type. That the presence of a storefront awning will be in keeping with the age and style of the building. That the proposed awning will be simply designed typical in terms uh, of material and profile and compatible with the historic palette of the building. And that the presence of a window vitrine while preventing views into the shop restaurant will maintain a sense of the transparency and depth depth of this bay. However, I find that the awning will not be well related to the design of the cast iron entrance and frame in terms of its placement and size and will obscure significant features of the historic cast iron framing. And that the large size and prominent placement of the flagpole will draw undue attention to the installation and that the cumulative amount of sign with the flagpole for the single tenant will be excessive. I therefore recommend that the awning be omitted um, or changed to a narrow awning set between the cast iron piers and anchored only to the storefront infill. No, well, not, no that's not, that's not. No. Yeah, we're just omitting it from this application. I'll note that there is a staff level option for an awning between the pilasters that doesn't cause damage or obscure those pilasters, but that's something they can address with the staff. Sorry about that. That's okay. And the flagpole be omitted. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second the motion. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. I'm sorry. Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, Commissioner uh, Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner, De Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Ann Holford Smith. Sorry, Holford Smith. Aye. Uh, with nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so it's approved um, except for the awning and the flagpole, and th they can explore some options for a staff level solution with the staff that, uh, for an awning that meets the rules. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll move to the next item. And next item is number four, LPC 21 10893. It's an application for an amendment in the borough of Manhattan, block 605, lot 8, 657 Greenwich Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a school building designed by Thomas M. Bell and built in the early 1950s with additions built in 2012 and 2015. And the application is to modify the play cage, railings, and flue extensions approved under Certificate of Appropriateness 16-5387. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Jason, you now have control over the presentation. Please click on, the, on your screen, and then you can use your arrow keys to advance. Please state your name for the record, and you may begin. Um, actually, commissioners, I'm Bart Baldwin. I'm head of school, and I believe I'm speaking first. Um, I am, thank you for your time, and I am head of St. Louis School. My name is Bart Baldwin, and we do seek approval for adapting our rooftop space for outdoor play, movement, and learning use. Using rooftop space effectively, efficiently, and elegantly is something of a New York tradition, and some of our rooftop was part of our initial application to Landmarks nearly seven years ago and was approved by Landmarks. 
Back then, we anticipated creating a play and sports area with a cage protecting it and the children using it. Since then, both research and our experience with COVID have demonstrated that outdoor space significantly supports children's academic learning, social emotional development, and physical health. For that reason, we seek to maximize use of our rooftop by including a play field with a protective cage that allows children to hold scrimmages and practices in a variety of sports. We also want to build a modest safety fence around the perimeter of the school roof so that we can create outdoor learning space for use by all of our students. It will include some areas for children to grow plants and vegetables, flexible seating so classes can be held, and even access to water and viewing stands so that we can incorporate the sounds of the city, the views of the Hudson, and the New York skyline into all subjects for all grades. Our hope is to bring the city into the school and into our children's learning. In addition to supporting our students, we will also use the space to support our community neighbors. St. Luke's School has a long history of working in partnership with community organizations. When we built the expanded gym in 2012, we committed to using that space to support nonprofit organizations serving children. And in fact, that policy was passed and we offer the space at deeply discounted rates to nonprofit sports organizations. And we have a long history of working with DUS, Dribble and various community leagues. In addition, for more than 25 years, St. Luke's School has been a host site for GO, which is a reading and academic readiness program that supports over 700 children in the city attending underserved public schools, with about 85 attending Saturday classes with us during non-COVID times. Most evenings until about 6 p.m. and most Saturdays, you will find neighborhood children playing and learning at St. Luke's School. We have been in touch with these community partners and they are eager to use our field and learning areas to support this work. So we come to you today to seek your approval for our amended plans for our rooftop learning and play areas for our students, as well as for the community. And we thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. Thanks, Bart. Uh, my name is Mish Hunter, Lee Saltzman Architects. We're the preservation consultant for the project. Um, what we're presenting to you today is um, a comparison uh, between the 2014 Andrew Bartle design uh, which is shown here in red um, versus the currently proposed um, marble Fairbanks design that is shown in blue. So the um, modifications that are proposed, um, we can go into in more detail, but just to summarize in brief, the current uh, proposed design calls for a wider and taller play cage that you see here exactly outlined in blue. Um, we also are calling for a taller and a different um, configuration and run of guardrail also shown in blue. And then on the roof of the adjacent convent building, um, the previously approved switchback stair is called to be reconfigured uh, as a straight run stair shown in blue. Thanks very much, Jason. Can you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so just doing a section comparison, uh, you can see in red uh, the previously approved ADA design, uh, which was shorter and narrower, right? Um, and then the currently proposed uh, MFA design, which is taller and wider, shown in the blue. Next, please. The location of the building, uh, the school is located uh, in a, pretty much at the perimeter um, of the Greenwich Village Historic District, um, in particular bounded by uh, Christopher and Greenwich streets. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, existing condition photographs uh, show um, the condition of the school uh, from the street, as well as from the roof, main roof and the convent roof. Uh, and you can see um, the two-story um, extension that was uh, previously approved by the commission as part of the Andrew Bartle uh, design, um, and that was constructed. Um, and, uh, and then of course, the condition at the main roof of the school, and then uh, on the right side of the slide, uh, the condition at the roof of the convent building. You have the next slide, please. Uh, we have a series of comparison renderings um, on the left showing the renderings that were previously presented uh, by Andrew Bartle 
uh, as part of their presentation to the commission. Um, and then on the right hand side of these next few slides, you're going to see the per current proposed rendering condition. So on the left, uh, you see the play cage in the previous configuration. Um, and then on the right side, you see um, the new proposed MFA design of the play cage. Um, you also will see um, very, um, you know, very slightly the straight run stair above the convent building, and you will see um, the flue, boiler flue extension adjacent to the play cage. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So on the left, um, what was previously presented uh, with the Andrew Bartle design, and then on the right, uh, the currently proposed MFA design. So here, what you're going to see is the proposed um, uppermost portion of the play cage, and then also uh, the uh, upper portions of the guardrail, um, you know, when you're um, within, at this point, uh, within the, um, the green space adjacent to the school, part of the campus. Thank you. Um, and then this, this view on the left, again, showing the condition of the school from 2014 with the previously approved play cage um, and lower guardrail, and then the currently proposed uh, play cage, guardrail, and um, flu, boiler flu extension uh, at the far right-hand side um, of the play cage. Can I have the next, please? Uh, what we did to summarize the changes is prepared um, a comparative matrix uh, or schedule uh, that just outlines um, each component of the roof scope um, and what was previously approved uh, by the commission in um, 2014 versus what is currently requested now. Um, so, you know, breaking it down, the play cage, um, the height was um, previously presented at 17 feet or previously approved. Uh, what we are asking for now is 20 foot, eight inches. Um, and then in terms of width, um, it was previously um, presented at 30 foot, seven and a half inches, and currently proposed at 40 feet, 10 and five eighths. Um, there's not a significant change in the, in the finish, both um, uh, were sort of in a gray, uh, gray shade or gray tone. Um, what was per currently proposed is a painted stainless steel um, supports and then a um, Jacob Webnet uh, wire mesh steel infill. So all will be in a very a light gray um, tonality. Uh, the guardrails, um, what was previously approved was uh, three foot six and galvanized. And um, again, um, currently proposed eight foot painted steel, again, with the um, Jacob Webnet wire mesh infill. And um, the stair uh, previously approved at the switchback, um, currently proposed as the straight run uh, steel um, framing and the Jacob Webnet um, uh, fill and then um, wire mesh and then the uh, concrete um, poured concrete pan stairs. There's going to be a proposed um, some very a small increase in height in the boiler flue. Um, so it previously was uh, 20 feet and currently we're proposing 23, seven and a half inches. Um, the prior design did not call for play cage seating and the current proposed design uh, does call for play cage seating um, roughly above um, the mechanical um, runs on the roof, but it would not be visible from um, any public thoroughfare. It's quite quite low seating. And, um, and then what is proposed currently that was not part of the previous design um, are some wall safety pads, um, particularly at the northwest and south perimeters. Uh, these would be in gray finish um, and three foot six in height. So um, the, the, the changes we wanted to be very, very clear about so that there's no confusion. Um, Jason Roberts from MFA will walk you through um, the visibility comparisons and 
and then also the uh, design and material. Thank you. Okay, and maybe just before we do that, if we could go back to slide three, because I know you, you just went through this chart, but it's hard to visualize where these things are. So maybe if we go back to slide three, you can there. Oh, go back, go forward one. There we go. So uh, can you just sort of explain where the play cage is, where the three foot six guardrail that is now eight feet is, sure. and then any other component that may be visible on this plan? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the first, of course, is the, the play cage um, in blue, outlined in blue, which uh, Jason's uh, cursor is pointing to. So you can see um, that this is now proposed to be wider the comparison of the height um, we can show in the section again um, between the red, which was the 2014 approval versus the 2021 proposed. So again, um, asking for something that is uh, wider and taller, um, but in very much a similar footprint location on the main roof of the school uh, to what the commission had previously reviewed and approved. Um, in terms of the uh, location uh, of the guardrail, the guardrail was previously three foot six, um, and it was a different footprint, um, creating uh, a smaller um, outdoor play space um, in 2014. And what is currently proposed, the eight foot, so there's going to be a different configuration in the blue, which Jason's cursor is, is uh, showing. And this would capture uh, slightly more uh, floor, uh, sorry, roof space um, for the children for their outdoor programming. And again, um, this is uh, shown in the blue. Um, but yes, there would be a different visibility um, for this. Uh, and again, we, we've documented this with uh, mock-ups and again, we'll, we'll show those, uh, that visibility, both in mock-up and in um, uh, sort of photorealistic, um, you know, uh, Photoshop images uh, later in the presentation. And then on the adjacent uh, convent building, uh, so it's a lower roof, um, what was previously proposed and approved was a switchback stair. Um, what is currently proposed is the uh, straight run stair. Um, again, very similar location to what was um, reviewed and approved previously, um, but the visibility will change slightly because it's going to be narrower and um, not as close to the street wall of the building. Jason, can you just um, indicate the location of um, Greenwich Street, just so that everyone knows the orientation? Yeah, and then just show um, Christopher Street yeah, exactly. So that everyone really understands where the street um, faces are uh, for the school. And then uh, the only other element really is um, two other elements. One is the um, uh, boiler flue extension. So you can see that. And again, the importance there is um, because the MEP engineer really um, thinks for, the, for safety, we just need to have that extend above the height of the play cage just to make sure that um, any exhaust um, does not deteriorate the, the play cage material or its finish um, over time. And then um, Jason, if you can just sort of point to the location of the play cage seating that's proposed exactly. So that again would not be visible from any public thoroughfare, it's quite low. Um, it's, in, it's proposed to be in wood and um, roughly co coincides with the location of existing mechanical um, equipment that would be concealed, um, but of course would be accessible for any maintenance uh, requirements. And then uh, just the last, Jason, let's just walk them through where the, the pads, these are safety pads of the children um, in any way during their sports play impact um, the side walls of the play cage uh, that they won't be injured. So these are going to be in a gray finish, uh, three foot six in height, so it's quite low. And uh, the gray, gray finish of the um, safety pads will be very similar 
and color to the gray finish um, of the play cage itself. So trying to look for something that's uh, in tonality um, harmonious and not calling attention to itself. Does that help you, Sarah? That's great. Thank you very much. It's very okay. clear, Misha. That's thank great. you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Jason, maybe you, oh, well, yeah. Maybe you can go through the visibility now, Jason. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Misha. Uh, I'm Jason Roberts. I'm with uh, the architect Marble Fairbanks. Um, and uh, the, what you're looking at here is the visibility matrix that we put together uh, for this project. Um, there's a, uh, approximately 60 views, uh, which are all part of the appendix. Uh, so if you want to do a deep dive, um, we've taken uh, renderings uh, from each of these locations uh, to illustrate what the visibility is like for this structure. Uh, we're actually going to focus on um, four of those uh, prime locations. Uh, so this view is taken from the corner of Christopher Street and Greenwich Street. You can see here indicated with number four here. Um, so this is looking at the building in three different uh, kind of iterations. We have an unaltered photograph of the guardrail mock-up, as Misha noted. We have a, a mock-up that uh, indicates the extents of the uh, taller guardrail. Uh, it is uh, done in orange construction fence, uh, which you can see a corner of it here. Um, and then we've indicated the, uh, the flue extension and the extents of the play cage uh, using story poles uh, so that uh, those poles are visible they weren't exactly visible in this view because of the vegetation, uh, but they are visible in some other views uh, that indicate the extents uh, of the play cage. Uh, so that is a photograph, uh, an unaltered photograph of the mock-up. Uh, we've done a photo collage of the proposed uh, 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 design here uh, that takes the uh, computer rendering and photoshops it into the a photograph um, of that same area. And then just for comparison, uh, we have a digital model uh, showing the previously approved Andrew Bartle play cage uh, in the lower left hand corner. Um, so looking at this from the corner of Christopher Street and Hudson Street, um, again, you can see in orange here, the orange uh, uh, mesh of the uh, taller guardrail uh, in this unaltered photograph of the mock-up. Um, this is what it looks like in the computer rendering. Again, as Misha noted, uh, it's a painted steel uh, uh, uprights uh, with a Jacob metal mesh infill, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, so it is very, very uh, transparent and light. Uh, and then by comparison, uh, the photo collage of Andrew Bartle's uh, previously approved design. Uh, a third view from the corner of Barrow Street and Greenwich Street, looking back toward the building, looking north uh, toward the uh, toward the building. Here you can actually see the story poles that we've mocked up uh, that extend uh, this uh, boiler flue uh, to the uh, over the uh, apex of the cage. You can see one story pole here that indicates the lower lowest most corner of the play cage. Uh, again, this is the computer uh, rendering uh, that is that has been photoshopped into that photograph, and then by comparison, the Andrew Bartle uh, design from 2014. And then lastly, uh, looking through the garden uh, past the church uh, from Hudson Street, uh, this view obviously very obscured by uh, vegetation. Um, so we've tried to digitally trim the trees a little bit so you could get a, a little bit of a glimpse of what that looks like uh, by comparison. So again, this is the computer model. Um, uh, photoshopped into an existing photograph and what the Andrew Bartle looked like, uh, proposal looked like by comparison. Completely obscured um, as a uh, mock-up. And then again, just to re reiterate what's there, what has been previously approved and what we're, we are proposing, um, this is the existing uh, roof plan uh, of the roof. There's an egress stair uh, at the uh, northwest corner of the roof. North on all of these plans is to the right. Uh, there's the elevator bank uh, here. There's an existing uh, mechanical unit located here and a duct run that runs across the roof uh, to feed the gymnasium below this space. Uh, and this is the convent uh, building to the south. Uh, Andrew Bartle's previously approved uh, plan, uh, as Misha mentioned, uh, has a uh, the play cage 
that uh, covers about two thirds of the southern end of the roof. Uh, it doesn't relocate this HVAC duct. The HVAC duct still goes through the play cage. Uh, he has the switchback second means of egress leading off the south end of the roof uh, and a, a path leading to the uh, stairway to the north. Uh, our proposal um, for one uh, with the taller uh, uh, guardrail uh, that uh, uh, rings in this area of the roof uh, to the north uh, is pulled back from this edge for fire department access. Uh, we have extended the, uh, the play cage and also uh, pushed the duct further to the east, relocated that duct so we can cover that duct with that um, that seating, that wood seating that um, Misha had described earlier. Uh, and then here you can see the revised second means of egress uh, as a straight run stair. Uh, talk briefly about lighting. Uh, light, the lighting that we're uh, looking at is uh, very targeted uh, because we know we don't want uh, spillover into adjacent neighbors. Um, the lights are primarily uh, for the field are, are uh, set at the apex. Uh, of the arches of the uh, of the play cage, uh, these will be the floodlights that flood the um, the, the play cage itself. Uh, we have a little bit of under uh, bench lighting uh, along the uh, along the seating bench here, uh, and then wherever we have the guardrail, we have integrated small integrated uh, puck lights into the handrail of the guardrail uh, that just provide enough illumination for uh, egress. Again, just looking at a comparison of what is existing. Uh, so this is an elevation of the school from Greenwich Street. Um, uh, what was uh, approved in, under the Certificate of Appropriateness in 2014, uh, you can see the height of the play cage here, uh, this, the uh, switchback stair, uh, which was actually enclosed over in this area, um, and the guardrail that remains uh, at its existing height of uh, 42 inches. Um, and then the proposed plan uh, of a uh, slightly taller uh, play cage structure, the single run stair uh, along the south here and the taller guardrail, uh, which then steps back uh, to be flush with the elevator bulkhead uh, as you head north. Uh, and lastly, in section. So again, this is an existing section through that gymnasium space, as I mentioned, that that uh, ductwork is feeding down into. Um, and the uh, previously approved uh, section that we've uh, uh, looked at at the beginning of this slide um, and the enlarged uh, uh, play cage that we're looking for approval today. Uh, looking at a few of the details of the play cage uh, and the, the structure itself, uh, this is that stepped seating uh, that Misha noted along the east side of the play cage uh, with steps that allow uh, students to either uh, observe what's going on in the field or do stretching and exercises um, on their own. Uh, other interior views of the play cage uh, showing the uh, safety padding along the uh, uh, other three sides of the cage. Uh, and a detail um, of that uh, single run stair that's running along the south end of the building um, using the same material language as the guardrails, uh, painted steel and metal mesh infill. Uh, we do have uh, specifications on the lighting. Uh, as I noted, these are the, uh, the floodlights that would be mounted at the apex of the, uh, of the structure providing light uh, onto the field. Um, and the uh, integrated uh, lights into the handrails along, along the egress paths to provide just enough targeted light uh, for egress. And then lastly, uh, some photos of the materials themselves. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the metal mesh that we're proposing that would be the primary uh, safety material for the cage and for the handrails. 
Uh, if you've been on the High Line, you're very familiar with this material. They use it in all of their uh, guardrails. Uh, it's very transparent, but very, very durable. Um, the steel itself will be painted a light gray color as well uh, as the safety pads. Uh, those would be light gray as well. Um, using a thermally modified wood for the play cage seating uh, and then poured concrete uh, in a metal pan for the single run stair. Uh, and that's all. Okay, great. Thank you for thank, your time. Thank you. Thank you for the very thorough presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions yet. So we'll move to public testimony and we'll see if we have any speakers. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa to take us through any public testimony. Lisa. Okay. I apologize. I was double muted. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, we don't have anybody signed up and I don't see anybody's hands raised. Hands okay. Raised. Um, so I think we don't have any testimony on this item. Okay, great. And I'll just note that Manhattan Community Board 2 recommended approval of the application as presented um, and that we also received a letter of support from Dribble, D-R-I-B-B-L, an organization that uh, I think uses the basketball court. Oh, Sarah? I'm yeah. Sorry. There, there were actually three letters of support uh, that were submitted and accepted okay. by the commission. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Okay. Commissioners, if we don't have any final questions, we can move to our discussion. So I'm going to start to request to unmute you all. Okay, and Commissioner Latvia, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and as you know, this is a sort of later building within this complex that has um, served as a school. And in the past, as has been presented, we approved modifications um, at the roof level for play space and uh, um, circulation and mechanical equipment. And so the application today is to really uh, sort of modify that design um, as time has gone by, needs and programming have changed. And um, so they've shifted it, um, but trying to keep in the spirit of the original approval. So we'll go ahead and start our discussion. Commissioner Bland, would you start this one? Sure. Um, be, I would be hard pressed ever to oppose uh, the beneficial use of rooftops in New York City, as maybe you might remember from uh, previous years of uh, supporting such things. Um, I view this as um, a, a reasonably minimal change from what we've approved in the past uh, on this, uh, as you said, relatively new building. So I support it fully. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Uh, I am going to um, just echo uh, what Fred said. First of all, the use is terrific. Uh, we did approve this project uh, to begin with. They just didn't get to this particular aspect of it. Um, but they've, uh, even with the slight increase in visibility, they can, they've, uh, you know, they're using materials that are, are very neutral and uh, transparent in many instances. And I don't think it's going to make a big impact on the landscape on, and it's not going to impact the integrity of the, the building. So I can support it. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah. The, the play cage. The new proportion is appropriate. Extended through an extended stair are appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, yes, I think you, you're right. The modifications to the play cage and to the railings um, and even the extensions are absolutely in the spirit of the original approval. So I think it's appropriate and approved. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith. I agree. I think it's a, a 
a good use of the, to expand the use of the roof and you know, minimally or modestly change from the original. So I, I can support it. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Yes, I agree with the previous comments. And uh, I think that the light structure of the plate cage will not be uh, you know, significantly visible uh, in the context of the uh, uh, no, historic district. So I can approve it. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. I can approve it. And Commissioner Chen. I agree. Okay, so we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Bland, I don't, do you have um, Well, I, I have to read it on this. I'd, I'm I'd, happy to do it. Let me do it, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Oops, let me just pull it up. Okay. In the matter of docket number 2110893, 657 Greenwich Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, a school building designed by Thomas M. Bell and built in the early 1950s with additions built in 2012 and 2015. This is an application to modify the play cage, railings and flue extensions approved under certificate of appropriateness 16-5387. And I recommend uh, approval finding that the St. Luke's church complex has a history of change with various building types added and removed over time, including the demolition of the entire block of row houses and the construction of a school building and gymnasium in the 1950s and the enlargement of the school building in 2012 and 2015 and the construction of a large visible rooftop play, create, play cage structure and associated fencing is consistent with this history of change. That the construction of the proposed play cage structure, access stair and railings will not result in damage to or demolition of any significant architectural features of the roof. That the proposed play cage is only modestly larger and somewhat more visible than the one which was previously approved and has been adjusted according to current school needs. That the metal play cage seating and fabric safety pads are simply designed with a neutral finish and will not call undue attention to themselves on the roof line of this modern structure that the proposed railings will be seen in the context of other rooftop accretions and will be fabricated from a thin metal mesh, which is relatively transparent, that the extended flues and modified stairs will be in keeping with utilitarian rooftop accretions found within the surrounding streetscape and throughout the historic district in terms of their material finish and visibility from public thoroughfare, thoroughfares, and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you and good luck. And we will now uh, break for lunch. We will take a half an hour break. So we'll come back at 1.20 and resume the afternoon session of our agenda. So, uh, and our agenda. So um, we'll ask all members of the public to exit the meeting at this time and to rejoin at 1.20. Commissioners, just turn your video and audio off.